get it. Um, oh, I'm slacking. Sorry about that, boss. No, that's quite all right. We we did miss the fourth class altogether. We had a a file corruption, and I I, I attributed it to a cable problem, but I don't know that was a guess with our IT guys. Not sure what happened, so we lost one class. But the rest of them are on YouTube, uh, and they are uh, in order by date and by class, this one being class six. So uh, by class six, I have uh, managed to slip backwards with what I was entrusted with by 1.84%. 1.84% may not seem like a lot, but it's only been two weeks. Uh, multiply that times 50, and that's a lot. And so this is one of the one of the things we're talking about when we talk about um, Kanban and when we talk about a little difference in a Kaizen activity. Those of you that are in lean uh, and have studied lean manufacturing principles understand that um, there's a lot of resistance sometimes because it's not such a big deal. It's only 1.8%. It's not that much of an improvement. And the Japanese say, uh, I'll take tiny improvements all day because they all add up. And they, they're the easy ones to fix, and they're the ones that, uh, in the end, make a big difference. Investment uh, is the same idea. The little bit does make the difference. And when we're going south, that's not something we want to do. Uh, Jake and his savvy behind the scenes investment team has managed into that same two week period to make 6%. Okay, now multiply that times 50. Okay, that's, that's a big number. So keep it on a roll and you've got a tax problem, and that's awesome. It's exactly what you want to have, right? Um, now, if we're driving our business, that's, um, I want to address that just for a second or two. Some of you, when you made your buys, made your buys best on, based on uh, asking somebody else, doing a little market research, Googling things up, looking for the, the fastest moving stocks or the greatest gains yesterday on the market and made investments accordingly. Um, that's not as thorough as we would want to do because we, once again, are based on historical information. Yes, sir? What if you just chose the best looking logos in the thing? I mean, that's <laughs> you know, I've, I've done an interesting start. I've done a whole 3% just by doing that. And it, it, when we look at gambling, uh, that's, that's looking at as investing as a gamble. And, and uh, I, I had an interesting thing. I'll maybe show you the data after the Super Bowl was o over. Uh, I'm in a football NFL pool, um, not a big one. This one's $20 to buy in at the first of the year. And it, that's all. <laughs> that's it for the whole year, 20 bucks. And so whoever wins it gets, you know, 400 bucks or 600 bucks, something like that. It's enough that it's it's a nice party that you can have uh, at the end. But I, I have been putting in uh, picks all season. I've been putting my picks in, but I've got two other accounts on the pool uh, that, I've, that are phantom accounts, and I've been putting in on one of them. Uh, I've picked all home teams. So every home game, that person picked. And on the other one, every visiting team they picked. And that's an interesting set of data. If you didn't, if you just like the football logo the best and you picked my logo, you're gonna, you're gonna win some. And I'll show you that data uh, if, if you're complete, uh, completely ignorant in the World Cup soccer and you just bet on the home teams, you're going to be better than if you bet on the way teams. And I'll show you that data for NFL. I don't have it for soccer. But uh, I know as little about soccer uh, that that's how I would have to do it. I'd have to pick the logo I like the color of, or I'd have to pick the name of the, that I like the name or that I could pronounce, or, <laughs> or something you know, in, 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 in selecting it. People buy stock based on that stuff. Jake doesn't. Tell me a little bit about what you told me in privately about why you picked one or two of the picks that you picked. AMD, for example. What, what AMD, I, I, I've been buying AMD for use in 1996. Okay. Uh, so I'm an AMD guy. Last year, they released a lot of, uh, they've been on an upward trajectory on, on their CPUs and GPUs for probably about five years now. So, uh, and they, they released new 
use CPU. Uh, and just recently, in the last several months, they've released three versions of the, of the new CPU. And they are also started a GPU release. And they're starting server CPU releases here soon. Okay. Uh, so that, just the knowledge of the industry, I was like, that's probably a safe bet. Uh, I just purchased some TSMC stock on this game. Because every CPU, GPU, AMD perch or builds is built on TSMC wafers. Uh, so essentially, it's like you buy one, you buy the other. You if know? this one does well, it, it should. Whoever's attached to it, exactly. should exactly. the caboose should do well as well. Uh, Apple used to buy TSMC, but they're running Samsung guys now on all their ARM CPUs. Uh, so Apple, but Apple has released the two, and they released the M1, the M1 Max, and the M1 or something like that last year. And so they're going to do that same effect with the M2 chips at this year. So I figured that one was a pretty good bet to buy that. Uh, Microsoft is Microsoft, but because the new Xboxes are uh, all made with AMD CPUs and GPUs, so it's actually called an APU, advanced power unit, uh, every time Microsoft sells an Xbox, AMD gets one. And then every time Microsoft, uh, or every time any CPU, or, no, sorry, computer manufacturer that does, that builds home, like all-in-one units and stuff like that, has a, win a, a copy of Windows on it. So, yeah. I knew Microsoft would be a safe bet. So, okay. the other ones I've just kind of played with, I bought Tesla, I bought, I bought some Intel stuff, but then I thought this was a financial management class, not Chinese. <laughs> right? You're talking, it's like oh, a foreign language. Like, what is it? I'm with you. Everything's yeah, an initial. Oh, yeah. Buy computer nerd stuff. I wonder yeah. your name support tech. Yeah. 2023. So, so the, the investment was made for a rationale behind it. The only thing that he just said that was looking out the rearview mirror was that he's invested in AMD personally for a while and and likes the way it has performed historically. All of the rest of the commentary was based on they will release when Microsoft does sell, it will it will it will put revenue in that direction. So that was all based on promising thought about the future. So we would could maybe ask the question, uh, how many of us in our Phantom portfolio lost money today. And we could look and see that that some are down overall, and none of this reflects the individual movements within an account, but but most of the people uh, in this uh, uh, group made some money by the end of the day today. Most of the people lost money yesterday. And, and if we were to micromanage an account, uh, and we were to say, why did Apple go down? Why did it lose a few points? What happened? Uh, and they didn't, by the way. But uh, who's, who has an example of one that did lose over either yesterday or today or both? I haven't even checked. What is that? I haven't checked, but I'm sure the cat's down. Cat. So Caterpillar is a name brand everybody knows. Worldwide dominance in, in the business that you're in. Uh, have been and there's but there's a lot of there's a lot of predators out there trying to take their business from Japan, Korea, and China, right? And they have been for uh, a, a, a while. This is not a new new move, but we would ask the question: Why did Cat lose money? And I, none of us know the answer. You know, but often the answer we think it's because of a stock report or a movement, or an announcement, or a promising thing, a contract they lost, something that's going on about um, you know, emissions on an engine that they don't have a, 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 a deaf answer on uh, to reduce emissions. Something, something that happens that the market doesn't like. I'm bringing that up simply to, to as we do this, I want us to I, I, there's some method to my madness on this. One, I want us to understand that 
uh, we are safer in general looking out the front window than we are looking out the rearview mirror. So all this financial statement ability that we gather is not necessarily going to change the course we're on unless we're already broke and don't know it. And sometimes that's the case with companies. They, they're they're uh, operating on, uh, on belief that isn't actual factual. Uh, so one of the things I want us to understand is that, the, the, that we can invest based on uh, promises or that we think about the future, optimism that we have in the future. That comes from analysts, media, sometimes political, but most often from press releases from the company. The company talks about how good life is in in their paradise. In the small companies that we are uh, uh, off, often working in, the companies are pretty secretive about what they're doing. And in public companies, they're pretty open about what they're doing because they want the world to invest in their company based on we're releasing three new things. And now the, the market might get ticked off if the releases are delayed. If there's a problem, if we're coming out a new game platform uh, in September in time for Christmas and it doesn't actually release until January, we've lost Christmas and the market, the stock's going to pay for that. It may recover, but it's going to... There's going to be an up and down based on that. If you wanted to buy and sell quickly, you could you could potentially profit from that uh, undulation in the market. But that's not what we're talking about here. I'm ta I'm headed to the point of what if you are the one driving the company, and you are the one that's creating the optimism in the company. If it's not public investors that we're concerned about, could we should we be concerned about the employees that work there now? Yeah. Isn't the same news important to them? Doesn't it impact them? The answer is absolutely. Creating a promising future, creating a, a compelling future actually, is something that, that we want to be able to do for the current existing employees. And if we have investors that are private, you know, uh, Uncle Harry's put some money into the business, well, we gotta make Uncle Harry feel good about his money and where we're going and what we're doing with that. And if the public has, if we're tr our stock is traded, then we must in investor relations, communicate with those investors, uh, the ones that are in and the ones that might put in. We want to entice them to invest in our company. Now, so that's kind of one reason that we're talking about this. Two, we always seem to try to figure out why did a stock go down? What happened? And if it's going down on a, on a, a trend down, you know, one day's Fluctuation is usually driven off of whims, uh, marginal investment moves by large uh, 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 institutional <coughs> investors that just is kind of just the noise of, of the overall market. But if there's a trend that's going down, it goes back to something that probably has to do with meat and potatoes. Something's wrong in the industry, something's wrong with the technology, or something's actually broken with the company, or something's broken with the, the buyers. The, 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 that's the market. But, but very specifically, uh, you know, we may, you know, once upon a time, uh, everybody was good with uh, the way the infrastructure was built in the United States. And, and California said, we're not going to buy any power that has anything to do with coal, period. And the $2 billion we invested in Delta, Utah for a coal-fired power plant all of a sudden went up in smoke, right? It was just like their customers were California. California said they can't buy any. That was not a reference to up in smoke, just in case you wanted to know. Uh, and and uh, uh, although California's impacted that market as well. I saw a thing on TV about the local drug dealers are having problems in California because the state's selling it all. The, the largest seller of weed right now is the Sheriff's Department in San Bernardino County <laughs> in California. That's a true story. They, they are, all they confiscate and they grow and, and support. And it's the Sheriff's Department. Like, wow, things have changed when I was a kid in college. Right. <laughs> things have really changed. Uh, anyway, that, I don't know how I got to that spot. But the reason <laughs> stock goes down, I think it's your guys' fault back there. I think it's snickered at something I said. Uh, when the stock goes down, why did it go down? And that's something that we want to know. Uh, as an investor, we want to know, should I pull out and sell? Should I short it? Should I weigh it out? 
write it out. Do I think things are going to turn back around? Warren Buffett told us in one of the videos we watched not to worry about the price we got in at. Worry about where is it today and where is it going? And if it's something that's a lost cause, you know, his, his opinion is I don't want to buy anything unless I'm going to keep it forever. And forever to Warren Buffett's like another few years probably. Yeah. He's, not, you know, he's not as young as he once was. And, and, but the point is he does not buy something that he wants to flip tomorrow as, as a rule. Uh, he wants to buy something that he can stay in. And that's his opinion. That's not necessarily everybody else's opinion, but it is his opinion, and, 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 and it gives us an ability to, to buy and then watch and then learn a lot about something that we are invested in. As the driver of a company, or as a driver of the managers of, in a company, and we are influential in that direction, we want to give, um, to prevent why did this stock drop? Why did this stock plummet? Why did the stock go down? We want to prevent that um, because we want to sustain a strong value-added long-term earnings company. And so to do that, we don't want trends going south. And so we want to study and know the answers. Why is it that companies' stocks go up and down? And when we see slides, we think, what could we have done to have avoided that slide if we see that in a market? And if our company is active in a market, what could we do to avoid that slide? Uh, you're hooked up with Best Buy and the training there. We all saw Circuit City be uh, evaluated as one of the best firms uh, in the world. Uh, the Good to Great book, they were one of the 11 companies talked about in that book as being great. And shortly after that, Circuit City biffed. Uh, they did a big belly flop, and they made some crucial mistakes, which uh, we've, I mean, the whole world has analyzed what they did. Uh, one of the mistakes they make is they said, we're spending too much money on labor. And so we are going to uh, get rid of all the, the higher end employees that we can, which in their case, uh, they preserved the Oval Office, so they didn't fire themselves but they laid off uh, all the best paid salesmen in the United States uh, on a Thursday morning about 11 o'clock New York time. And that was, a, that was a fatal move. They took their best top performing people, the ones that were making it happen and getting it done, because they're working on commission. So if they're your best paid people, that means they're the ones that are getting it done. So those aren't the ones, you don't look at how much it's costing you to have them, it's looking at what would it cost you if you didn't have them, if they weren't doing their job. And I said 11 o'clock because my information is that's about when that news became public. And you know, in today's social media, I just got fired. How many times did that get text <laughs> by, across the United States? It took Best Buy about a half hour to hear about it. And within another minutes, Literally, Best Buy sent out store managers nationally, hire every Circuit City salesperson you could find that was just laid off. They hired them all, if they could find them. They hired them all. And so think about that for a second. The product line they were knowledgeable in, what they were selling, is, was it different? Same stuff, same things. It was a network, a computer, a phone, whatever it was, same thing. And so they hired experts that were trained on somebody else's dollar and brought them in and later wrote a book about that. I have copies of both, Good to Great, and uh, what's, what's the name of the Best Buy? What's going on at Best Buy? What's, uh, can't recall the title of it exactly. It's blue and yellow on the cover. I'll bring it in and let y'all look at it. Um, you might especially be interested in it. And since then, I've done it, taken another job on the side, helping a company here locally in in the medical arena, and the CEO of that company, his daughter-in-law is the CEO of Best Buy. And so I've had some chances to, uh, to learn more after they wrote the book about what did Best Buy do to drive, how did Best Buy survive and Circuit City fail? And that's an interesting question when they sold the same stuff in a store of the same size in, in the same markets, the same suburbs in America, you know? And, and that was all came down to a discovery that it was management. And 
Best Buy started the research in their own stores. Uh, they saw that Circuit City was making mistakes and they'd hired a bunch of the people, so they knew quite a bit about what Circuit City was doing. Circuit City made another fatal move, by the way, just on the side. After they did that, uh, they realized that their costs of distribution were high and the costs of distribution were higher than Best Buy's, uh, specifically, and a few other smaller chains that were uh, across the nation. And, and so their response to that, to lower distribution costs, was saying, what is it that's costing the most for distribution? And they learned that it was their appliances. You know, washers this big and takes up an awful lot of warehouse space. And it also takes up a lot of, of, uh, of floor space in the store. And, and it also costs a bunch to put in a truck and ship. You know, you got refrigerators, they're bigger, you know? And so um, they looked and saw Best Buy didn't sell them that way uh, by stocking lots of them and putting them in their, their uh, uh, distribution warehouses. Uh, and, and, and in fact, uh, Circuit City in one uh, weekend uh, took all of the appliances out of their stores. And they replaced the appliances in their stores with Anybody remember what that was? They took the score footage out the, for appliances and put something else in. Video games, which video games are, are great. Video games are great business, but they don't take, and, and they were great because they don't take a lot of floor space, but their buyers weren't the, the same market uh, that were buying video games. Video game buyers uh, are buying through GameStop and, and, and uh, online and, and other places and, and and so we weren't going retail for our games. Walmart wasn't playing at that point in time. Walmart now has, you know, tiny square footage to some video games. But, um, you know, how, much, how many video games does Costco have? I mean, randomly, ones that are being closed out, maybe they buy a truckload of. But that's not, their, that's not their marketplace. And what Circuit City did not realize at the time was people were walking into their store because mom needed a new refrigerator and was sick and tired of the old one and didn't want to go to Home Depot. So she went to Circuit City. And while she's going through Circuit City, that's, that's not meant to be um, gender bias of any kind. But what happened was dad wasn't interested in the refrigerator. He hung out where the game was on on the TV. And he saw this big screen TV and it did stuff that his didn't do. And he goes, whoa. We need one of these. And do you hear that sound? Mom's buying a refrigerator. Dad just bought $10,000 worth of audio stuff for the, the family room. Circuit City didn't realize that's how the people that were buying those entertainment systems didn't come into store to buy them. They came into store to buy appliance. Who knew? Circuit City didn't. Best Buy found out fast enough that Best Buy still sells appliances, but you've kind of got to order, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and so they don't, they don't clog down their distribution system with them. And in the meantime, Sears was the biggest appliance seller in the world. And I don't know what Sears did to themselves, but Kenmore is no more, basically. And what happened? Lowe's and Home Depot took the appliance market. And, and uh, Callie's not here tonight to uh, tell us about it. She texted me. Uh, earlier, her mom's teaching, by the way, uh, over a class tonight, and uh, and so she's helping with that, which I think is awesome. Uh, but she's in an a small appli niche market appliance company that can't scale. Um, the appliance uh, marketplace is taken up. If you in the appliance business, you better be happy with a local market because you're not going to get a national one now. The space is occupied, unless something else dramatic happens. By you know, dramatic meaning Home Depot says we're not going to do that anymore. And then all of a sudden there'd be an opportunity or, you know, I don't know what. But anyway, uh, as we look at driving a company, why does a company go stop, go down? Those were a couple of questions in the retrospect we can look at with Circuit City. Uh, and at, at Best Buy, they did another experiment during that period of time. And one of those experiments was they looked at stores that were exactly the same square footage uh, in suburban American marketplaces where the demographics were similar. So all, all, all towns have a poor area, a rich area, and an average area. And uh, Best Buy was most effective in the middle class neighborhoods. Uh, the richest people in America don't buy Best Buy stuff. They buy higher end uh, stuff. 
if they can find it, and it's one off, and the more expensive it is, the prouder they are of it. Uh, and, and, and that's how that model works. So Best Buy is okay with that. Uh, but what they looked at stores, at, they looked at their top performing stores in the United States, and they found stores that were exactly like those stores in equivalent market demographic of marketplace of, 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 of race and, and job and income and age and all of those factors. And they looked at their least, their worst performing stores in the United States that were just like, it. same size, same everything. And they switched management teams, literally moving people out of Atlanta, putting them in Chicago, moving people out of Philadelphia, putting them in San Francisco, literally taking store managers and this secondary management team, ripping them out of the store, paying them well to do it, and saying, "We got to see what happens. Is this because of the store? Or is it because of management?" Anybody know the answer to that? They switched. They switched. The performance switched. It was management. So that's what they wrote the book about. What did those managers do differently? How did they do that? And they found phrases that they said. They found cultures that they built. They found timing of how they did things. The point here isn't a lesson on that. There's a book on it if you're interested in it. Read the book. Uh, and if you stay working there for a while longer, you'll really want to read the book because you'll see whether they're still doing it or not because they may be not. They maybe did something that turned them around and let them grab everything that Circuit City had and grow from there. Best Buy is doing well, but there's no guarantee that they will continue to do well, right? We're all capable of having a management change and then hitting the wall. And we've seen too many companies do that. So that's the part that, that I'm interested in. How do we see from a performance perspective early signs that we got trouble? Uh, and and, and I, I want to see those signs internally before the investors, whether they're private investors, my family investors, or public investors, before they see it. And that's really what this class is about. How do we use numbers in finance to see what's coming in our company and catch it before we've got a trend that's not reversible? Because at that point in time, it's just a matter of cleaning up at, a, at a, an auction sale. When Pace American Trailers here in town, some of you worked there and, and knew people that worked there, uh, you know, when they finally decided to fold up uh, shop. Uh, we had the best auction of welders I've ever seen. You could buy these beautiful welders. I don't know the text of specs on welders. If you guys know the specs on welders, you probably bought some of them at their, at their auction. They had brand new welders hanging from the ceiling. They had 50 or 60 of them, and some of them sold for 200 bucks because nobody else wanted a welder <laughs> at that point, at that sale. Uh, you know, they just, you know, and that's what happens when you liquidate a company. You don't get anything in a bankruptcy sale. These assets that we show on our balance sheet, sometimes those are not, you're not going to get that much when you sell it at a bankruptcy sale, you know. And, I mean, the best place to buy a dump truck is at a bankruptcy sale. That, 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 that auction house that you see on the left of I-15 before you get to the speedway. What's it, Richie? Is that? Richie Brothers. Yep. They sell good stuff, don't they? Yep. You know, some of it's almost brand new stuff. Somebody bought it for There's one job saying, and they... Though. Okay, all right. That's, that's true. That's very, same with cars. Yeah, all bad cars, the dealer doesn't try to dress them up, put lipstick on them. They send them to the auction. But at that auction, you can buy some awesome stuff. In, in the, in. So that's a, good, that's a good note to self that we'll have to remember. All right, so we've been talking about our, our investors and I, 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 the investments we're making. And I don't think, Brad, you saw where you're at, but you're, you're, you're one of them that's doing well. Uh, yeah, I think like 103,000 or something. Are you number three right there? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the market was good to you uh, today as well. You're just a nudge behind the second place, and Andy, you're just pennies away from. I've almost got I was doing really time. good, so that's only from Friday. Okay. Because I was gone the first that's week, true. right? That's, that's true. only from Friday. So, so, so yeah, nicely done. So watch out. Right, we got, we got some. Hanging on to it. <laughs> I actually lost money on AMD today. Well, in the end of the day, Mindy may wind up with most money. Right. <laughs> that's very true. Cool. Get it yeah. together. Her little strategy to kind of wait. The market's not quite ready for me yet. Things need to settle down, and in some companies, they certainly do. All right. Uh, 
we are going to do some ratio analysis, but to get there, we've got to talk a little bit about uh, cash flow <coughs> again. And um, let me get to the spot where we want to do that. Right there. And so this is the handout we started out with, and, and we've worked our way all the way up to slide 15 on it. Uh, but we're going to we're going to look at the cash flow statement, and I would say this is one of the poor, most poor, more, yeah, of the three financial statements that we look at, this is the least understood by the most people, in my opinion. And, and that's too bad because it's, it's really got some of the most important information, and that is how is cash working its way through your business, and, and uh, what do you have left in your pocket as the owner at the end of the day. And that really is what matters to the investors that own the company. How much is in the pocket at the end of the day? So we're going to do like we always do. We're going to read around the room uh, and understand cash flow statement a little bit. Uh, we will, I will introduce you to the ratio analysis that we're going to do before we talk about all the ratios. Uh, and we're going to introduce the ratios from uh, this handout as well. And then we're going to start a exercise from your handouts on ratio analysis for a company out of Las Vegas. So let's let's read the cash flow statement information. Jake, we start with you. The cash flow statement provides a detailed picture of what happened to a business's cash during a specified duration of time, known as the account, uh, known as an accounting period. It demonstrates an organization's ability to operate in a short and long term. So we saw on the video of the book, we saw that there were some kinds of businesses, and he demonstrated using Netflix and uh, Amazon and Tesla, that cash behaved differently in those three businesses. That was a little bit of a surprise uh, to <coughs> most that haven't looked into understanding cash flow statements. And, and, and some of them had data uh, that, that you know, cash is being generated almost off the books in, in a sense. And that was that was Amazon, and and uh, uh, Tesla is generating a lot of cash that's on the books, but they're for cars that they haven't yet built. If you want to buy a Tesla, you got to send them money to get on the waiting list, and they did that much better uh, on a smaller scale. Uh, yeah, yeah, smaller scale. Um, Corvette, Chevy did the did the did a different thing when they've rolled out uh, the last three years of Corvettes uh, that. Uh, surprising to them, not sure why they've been in high demand, and and uh, uh, people have put money to get on waiting lists to get the C8 Corvette. Uh, they made 40,000 of them last year, which is a lot fewer than we made of Teslas, but still 40,000 vehicles is a lot of cash. Uh, and and uh, 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 General Motors did not take the cash. Tesla does take the cash. General Motors did it uh, in a very, very weird way. Uh, some local dealers would take cash uh, and, and hold your spot. I've, I've got a deposit for the Z06 and uh, probably never will get one uh, through putting a deposit. It didn't go to the deposits being held by a dealership. And so it would come out of their allocation. If they get an al allocation and I at that time, whenever that is, uh, if I don't get outbid, uh, somebody, I, I will get the car, but the chances of that happening, even though I've got my money on hold, and I, I had a deposit for the C8, the, the current uh, style, body style that came out uh, three years ago, and I had money before it came out uh, at Stephen Wade, and they still haven't, my name still hasn't come up, I'm still 30 or 40 on the list to get a new one at sticker price through Stephen Wade. And the reason for that is they're all selling above sticker price. And, and they will for a while, and then, they'll, they'll, then they won't. And, and uh, they'll go down in value, and then at some point in time when they're collectible cars again, they'll go back up in value, like the 63 split window coupe or one of those if you're a car person. Uh, and that's how, that's how cars work. Cars are not a great investment. Cars are depreciating assets, so don't let me uh, let you think that I think that's a good investment. It's not. But... Uh, there's a cash opportunity there that General Motors did not, has not stepped up and taken on. Serial number one of the Z06, it's now being built in, 
in, uh, in Kentucky, uh, Bowling Green, Kentucky, and uh, a few have rolled off the assembly line. Serial number one was bought at the Barrett Jackson auction by Hendricks Racing, and they paid $6 million plus the cost, the price of the car uh, for serial number one. They also bought serial number two for a few million less, and uh, they've got a production run of 576 this year, the first two units selling for $10 million. Uh, General Motors, Motors screwed that up. That could have been their cash. Instead, it was a dealer's cash. Barrett Jackson took a piece of it. How'd that? Tesla didn't do that, right? Doesn't do that. Uh, Tesla's introduced, introduced a few cars that were similarly desirable. There was a Tesla Roadster, for those of you that remember that way back. That was the first one, in fact. And those are worth a ton of money now. And Tesla managed the cash differently and better. So what we're reading there is that during those accounting periods, it demonstrates the organization's ability to manage their cash. We got a lot to learn on this, all of us. General Motors even does, right? Uh, and, and in fact, General Motors has a lot to learn about business. They've been one of our blue stocks. I, don't, I doubt that any of you bought General Motors stock with your fake $100,000. Uh, they are not a desirable, we're not clamoring after General Motors. Why? Yes? What is a blue stock? Oh, I've used that a few times. Uh, I'm going to have to give, look up and give you a better answer for where the term came from. Uh, it's, a, it's a number of maybe 200 stocks that are considered by institutional investment groups. They've been profitable, reliable stocks for 100 years. So it's companies that were around a long time ago, were performing well, and, and <coughs> investors can kind of rely on them. They pay dividends. They generally go up in value. They may have a bad year here and there, but in general, these are called blue chip. I'll, I'll get you a better definition than that. Uh, probably owe it to all of us uh, to have a better definition of that. It's just a group of stocks that are considered by this. You're not going to get stupid rich off of it, but you're going to. You, it's a safe place to put your money uh, as you age, go retirement. It's a good place. To, it's a safe, uh, less of a gamble kind of group of stocks. Um, I'll, Thank you for asking that because I probably owe us all that answer. Um, I think you're pretty much on the nose with that definition. Did you just look it up? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, blue stock, blue chip stocks are huge companies with excellent reputations, often including some of the biggest household names. Yeah. Investors turn to blue chip stocks because they have dependable financials and often pay dividends. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And. Probably there's a list of which ones are and which ones aren't. General Motors is not something we, something we wanted to buy, and General Motors, part of the reason that is we've looked at General Motors, and in all of our lifetimes, we've watched General Motors close down Pontiac and, and uh, Saturn and, and brands that they, they owned, Oldsmobile, brands that they owned, and we've watched Hyundai and Kia take those markets away from them. And so had General Motors been tending to business the way they should have, Ford too at that time, but, uh, but, but specifically General Motors, the South Korean automotive market would not be dominant in the US right now. And right now they are. And, and uh, we've lost that by management practice and some bad decisions here and there. The, the brand still exists, it's a huge company and, and uh, its stock may be an okay investment, but it's not a sexy investment, it's, it's not it's not something that, that you would want to think that that's where we're going to uh, pay the kids' retirement out of. Uh, all right, keep reading. Eric, I mean, you got me off there. The purpose of a cash flow statement. By reading a cash flow statement, you can see how much cash different types of activities generate and make business decisions based on that analysis. It's important to note that cash flow is different from profit, which is why a cash flow statement is often interpreted with other financial documents. Okay, so we see profit on specifically which financial statement? That's the, the, that's the, the P&L, profit and loss statement, the income statement. That's where the profit specifically. Uh, the balance sheet's gonna give us a snapshot of where, where money might be, but uh, it's, it's the, uh, and so to put cash in perspective, we gotta, we gotta see how the profit flowed through, the what the company do with the money? We have a lot of companies that are profitable and not rich in cash because they blow the cash. They, they, they have fun with it or they squander it through excess investment 
uh, you know, build a bigger plant, build a better office, put a gym in, uh, you know, do whatever it is that, that they, they think they have enough money to do. It's their company, they can do that. Uh, but we need to understand from the cash flow statement in balance with what the p and is saying. So read Business Insight. Um, cash flow versus profit. The key difference in cash flow and profit is that while profit indicates the amount of money left over after all expenses have been paid, cash flow indicates that the net flow of cash into and out of a business. Okay, Wendy? Profit and cash flow are important in their own ways. As a manager, you need to understand both metrics and how they interact with you on and evaluate the financial health of a business. For example, it's possible for a company to be profitable and have a negative cash flow, hindering its ability to pay its expenses, expand, and grow. Similarly, a company with positive cash flow and increasing sales can fail to make a profit, as is the case with many startups and scaling businesses. So some businesses take a lot of money to get into it. You'll see a term uh, that's used in analysis of a company, it's called barrier to entry. And barrier to entry varies in, it's an industry thing, uh, it varies by industry. Uh, the more expensive that it is to start up this kind of a business, the higher the barrier of entry. On a simple scale, uh, in St. George, if you want to open up a restaurant and you're choosing between a subway uh, sandwich type of a restaurant versus a pizza place type of a restaurant versus an IHOP or a Denny's place type of a restaurant. And let's say you were going to make them all about the same size. And we know Denny's are usually bigger uh, uh, and, and there's a reason for that uh, in, in, in a minute we'll get to. Those three types of restaurants have three different barriers to entry. We'll take a guess of what, the, what that is. How, why is that? What, what are we talking about there? The kitchen. Is it like a startup cost? Yeah, kitchen. Oh. So, so think about the startup cost, the barrier of entry. Uh, if you're going to start up a subway, what do you need? You need a microwave. Yeah. And, and maybe you need something to bake the bread if you don't want to buy the bread. You don't have to bake your own bread. You can buy the bread, right? There's, there's local bakeries around that will sell you a Subway type of a cheese bread or whatever type of sandwich bread they're, the hoagie they're using. Uh, so you don't need much. But if you're going to do a pizza joint, what else do you need? You can't just do a microwave. You've got to have a pizza oven. And if you've got a pizza oven, you've got fumes going out. So you're going to have to have some sort of a, of a scrub system uh, going out the roof. So somebody's got to poke a hole in the roof. Landlords don't like that. Uh, it's going to cost you, and it's got to it's got to be health department type, so rats can't get in, and 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 grease doesn't get trapped in there if there's if there's oils in the air from your pepperoni, uh, and and so it's got to be stainless steel up there. So it's a higher barrier to entry. You got to spend more money for your pizza joint. If you're going Denny's, you got to have a grill, and that grill. S smoke has a lot of grease in it. Now you got a halon fire suppression thing you got to buy. That's a quarter of a million dollars if it's a good size one. Ours was here at the college. Uh, and, and, and so that kitchen, the build out for that kitchen costs more and more and more. I've been watching Zatavia Gardens out there. If you know that uh, restaurant in Kayenta, kind of a, an eclectic little uh, niche market uh, out uh, in Kayenta with the uh, they've got uh, ordinances. You can't have a, a light bulb that shines up, and you know nothing. You can't have grass in your yard, things like that in the community because they want it to be dark. They want it to be natural. They want it to. They, they, it, when you drive through there, there's a lot of houses that you discover are there you didn't even see they were there. That's not on accident. That's on purpose. They want the houses to blend in with the community. It's kind of cool. It makes for a high-end neighborhood. A lot of those houses are in millions of price range, right? And so there's a restaurant out there that's a good place to go just for coffee, if nothing else, if you're okay with a $6 cup of coffee. And, and uh, they have some nice uh, other things like the market that buys hummus. I don't buy hummus. I'm not that you can look at me and tell me I'm not a hummus. Hummus? I don't even know how you pronounce it. I'm not, I'm not that kind of a guy. Uh, and, and, but their market is, and, and they've been looking at expanding their kitchen, COVID hit. Uh, and uh, I just walked through, I, I think they're going to probably open 
and within six months now the stainless steel is all done but the amount of square footage that requires to grow a bigger kitchen now they sell steak and they sell good stuff out there uh, high-end type of, of plates a good place to you know take somebody on a birthday but uh, they want to do more and better and expand and and that, that's a that's a million dollar investment ish to to build a bigger kitchen so that's a higher barrier of entry some industries have much higher barriers of entry than that. If you've got to buy a nuclear reactor for your business, what does that cost? And where do you get one? And how do you get licensed for it? And, and, uh, and there are businesses that have those, by the way. Uh, there are medical device companies that, that do, you do cesium and uh, iodine and iridium for uh, cancer treatment. And so you've got to have a nuclear reactor for that. And so that means if I'm going to go compete with Varian or General Electric, I've got to buy a nuclear reactor. And so the barrier to entry is just huger and huger. And so uh, you've got to buy casting equipment. You've got to buy injection molding equipment. Or whatever the, bu the business is that you're thinking about getting into, it's better for your company, if you're into that business already, that it has a high barrier of entry because you're not going to have competitors pop up everywhere. If you are a weekend plumber, let's go HVAC. You've got your license in HVAC. And, and so um, uh, HVAC, what is the barrier of entry uh, to an HVAC person? They've got to have a huge amount of knowledge, but you can't tell whether they got it or not. I mean, <laughs> my head looks about like yours, about the same size. I got no knowledge of HVAC. You got a lot of knowledge of HVAC. Can't tell by looking. Maybe you can, but, but <laughs> let's pretend you can't. Uh, the, the, but the very, you just need a pickup truck, a tool belt. And the knowledge, right? You don't need, eh, maybe now today with HVAC, you gotta have a, a, a Freon license to, to suck you know, uh, fluorocarbons out of a system of you know, whatever coolants are. So there's a little more, you, you need a fancier machine that will do that, keep it captured, and you have to buy a license for that. Hundreds of dollars, not millions, right? And so the barrier of entry for an HVAC technician is mostly the training and education. It's not the tools. Buried entry in a gravel pit. It's not having the farm. It's having the crushers. It's having all of the conveyors, all of the equipment, and 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 what's required. The scales. I mean, how are you going to build a customer? How much? How much did they just get? Well, you got to have a, a a certified, traceable scale, right? And I don't have one of those. I might have the farm that's got the rocks, but I don't have the equipment. So the barrier to entry is high for a gravel pit operation, which leads to what? A concrete plant, which leads to a batch plant uh, of, of, for asphalt, a hot plant. Uh, these, these are the, that's where the supply chain goes, right? It, it, first, we gotta start with aggregate materials. And, and that business is so uh, unique and difficult to be profitable at that over time, it's migrated to a hand hold uh, full of people worldwide that, you know, the company that owns Kennecott Mines, for example, that's a gravel pit, right? It's just a mountain, they're taking everything out of it, but it's a big gravel pit, and, and, and maybe the biggest one in the world, not counting that one in Chile, it's pretty big too, about the same. And, and, Kennecott's and, the largest open surface mine in the world. Is it still? That's awesome. It's enormous. So the operating cost for something like that, it's owned by a company out of London. Uh, there's another company out of England called Old Castle, and they try to buy all the gravel pits they can they can buy, and they they're the money behind um, Western Rock. CRH. CRH. They're publicly traded. They are, yeah, they are, uh, but not on the U.S. train. Uh, they're out on the they are on the U.S. train. Yeah. They were on the, the London train. CRH company, not Old Castle. Not Old Castle. Okay, so they've they've consolidated. So there's an exit potential for building a profitable small business because there's a couple of worldwide companies that want to have it all. And so there's a potential of making something profitable that can get bought out. And as we look at investing in companies or making our company attractive, that's something that, we, that can be of advantage. My screen went out again, sorry about that. All right, we're not reading this very fast because I'm talking too much. Let's, let's go so we can make it. So we read this. <coughs> All right, where are we at? Brock? The contents of the cash flow statement. 
Cash flow statements are broken into three sections, cash flow of operating activities, cash flow from investing activities, and cash flow from financing activities. Operating activities detail cash flow that's generated once a company delivers its regular goods or services and includes both revenue and expenses. Investing activities compares, comprise of cash flow from purchasing or selling assets using free cash. No debt, this is usually in the form of physical properties such as real estate or vehicles and non-physical property like patents. Financing activity detail cash flow from both debt and equity financing. Ideally, cash from operating income should routinely exceed net income. A positive cash flow speaks to a company's financial stability and ability to grow its operations. Okay, let me work backwards just for a second up through that. Uh, remember we talked about debt, debt and equity financing uh, just a reminder that uh, debt financing is money you borrow from somebody and you've got to pay it back. And uh, equity financing is where you give somebody a percentage of your company. So they put money in and you give them 10% of the business or 50% of the business, depending on how much money they put in and what you want to do. So that's debt financing and equity financing. Every company has a certain number of financing activities that they need to account for. They have a certain number of investing activities that they need to account for, and they have a certain number of operating activities that they need to account for. Let's talk about a franchise for just a second. Franchise laws are different in every state in the U.S., uh, but uh, aggr like, aggregately, there are some very common themes to all franchise uh, laws in every state, and companies like McDonald's have to live within those franchise laws. Uh, here in Utah, uh, we have... Uh, the juicing company. Uh, Jamba Juice, is that? Chocolate Smoothie? Which one? Jamba. Jamba Juice is what? The one in the, uh, the, the Lowe's parking lot? Oh, I forgot about that, yeah. That, that's Jamba Juice? Okay, so Jamba Juice is a franchise, and they one of, one of their successful franchisees in Salt Lake decided to uh, compete with them. It's a low barrier of entry. You need a blender, right? Uh, so, so uh, and maybe a refrigerator. And, and so decided to compete with him. And he started up something called Zuka Juice. And he wanted to sell franchises in Zuka Juice. Uh, there was a guy that bought two of them here in St. George. Uh, one of them was in the, that little strip that Staples is in, um, in the center of that I, by Red Lobster there. I can't remember where the other one was at. Uh, Sunset someplace, and before he could sell franchises or offer franchises in Zuka Juice, he had to operate a Zuka Juice uh, to 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 show financially what a buyer of the franchise could expect. What, what, if I buy a McDonald's franchise, how much will it pay me? You know, how much dollars will we do? How much will I have to spend for labor, for training, for all of the things involved in it? And, and so uh, the, the investing activity for somebody that's franchising, it's non-physical property. It's like you buy, the, you sell franchises. And the guy, that, the guy that was doing the Zuka Juice stuff, it was a team of guys, uh, they were selling franchises. They, they first had to operate some stores so they could accrue some financial data that goes in their, their uh, offering. Sometimes that one's called a blue sky offering as well. Uh, and that off the financial statement saying, your results may be different, but we ran these three stores and this is what they actually produced. And they have to be audited. They have to be audited to bull by prospective franchisee buyers. And um, uh, so you go look at those stores, kick a tire, see how it is, say, I could do that. And so I'm going to buy a franchise. At Zuka Juice, you had to buy two. They were $75,000 each, $150,000. You owned two franchises of Zuka Juice. That was no real estate, no equipment, no property no oranges uh, or whatever materials. It was nothing. It was the right to buy that stuff from the franchise operator, Zuka Juice. So if you buy a Dairy Queen franchise, you're not going to buy ice cream from anybody else but Dairy Queen. You've got to buy from the corporate. That's why uh, it's taken a while for Dunkin' Donuts to build out here. Dunkin' Donuts has said we do well in certain markets, uh, but we, uh, I tried to put a Dunkin' Donuts uh, franchise here 15 years ago. And Dunkin' Donuts said, we don't have the supply chain to support a store in Utah. And they have, they have none. They still have none, in, I think. That's uh, why In-N-Out took so long to 
That's why in and out took so long. They couldn't get the supply. Because if you have a franchise, you have to buy your stuff from them. Otherwise, it might not taste like an in and out burger. You know, and you got to buy the French fry slicer and the potatoes from them because they've graded the potatoes to be the kind they want. And so that's how that franchise works. But on our cash flow statement, investing activities, it's part of the reason we're talking about an investment finance class here for corporate management. If you're going to own a store, or if you're going to own a business, or you're going to own a company, a corporation, you've got to have somebody helping you fill this out because your company's got to have investment activities. Back to uh, another franchise, McDonald's, we mentioned them. McDonald's does not view themselves, uh, over the years I've consulted for McDonald's and Oak Brook, corporate in a different lifetime, uh, when I was working with Air Products and Chemicals, and we were, they have test kitchens there that they try to figure out different ways to faster and how to cook food and how to do all that kind of stuff. And they, it's, it's a cool place. Um, but McDonald's doesn't consider themselves a hamburger joint corporately. They are a real estate firm. When you buy a franchise from uh, McDonald's, uh, like the brothers did here in uh, this franchise, McDonald's owns the property. And you buy the right to the franchise, in McDonald's case, for 20 years. And at the end of 20 years, they can take it away from you if they want to do that. Hopefully, you've made a profit consistently all 20 years. And if they take it away from you, uh, it sucks to be you. But uh, they have the right to do that. And you've hopefully made some money. If you operate correctly, they won't take it away from you. But it's a threat they have uh, to make you walk the line and do things the McDonald's way. And to have the McDonald's look and smell to your bathrooms or whatever it is. They, gotta, they inspect you and they have zone managers that do that. Uh, but that, uh, investing activities for McDonald's, look at their financial statements. They've got an enormous amount of money in, in land that they own. And then for, for small companies, like a family business like s, &S Steel, uh, that investment activities may be buying the land, buying the building they're in, and gifting them to the family that owns it. So you've got operating, operating business that's operating activities. That means welding up the steel and selling to your customers what you do, whatever it is. In McDonald's case, operating activities is making Big Macs, right? That's their operating activities. Financially, though, uh, the wealth of the company is in their real estate holdings. And, and that's an interesting thing. Uh, that's a beautiful thing. Somebody else has paid for all that real estate, right? You know? And, and it, it gives them the ability, like when... Uh, uh, there was that mass shooting at San Ysidro in the McDonald's a lot of years ago, right by, the Me by, by uh, uh, Tijuana uh, on the U.S. side. And they decided to, I don't remember how many were killed by the gunmen there, but they decided to make a memorial park out of the, the place. They tore the building down. It was a McDonald's. They owned it. Uh, they tore the building down and made a park out of it, and as they should. They did open another McDonald's later with another piece of land not too far from there, and I'm sure the franchisee got made whole through that. But the company, when they own the real estate, they're able to do that. Chick-fil-A owns most of their real estate in a partnership. Uh, other companies don't own their real estate at all. Uh, Jersey Mike's doesn't own it. Subway's doesn't own it. They, they lease all of the properties that they have. So different business models work different ways. So investment activities, sometimes you've got piles of cash, I, I asked the question uh, last class to find out any companies, if you could research a company that had a lot of cash. Um, I didn't, we didn't stay in class long enough to find out if you did. Uh, they, we'll come back to that question because later on uh, we will find that uh, there's about $13 trillion in cash held by the companies that are publicly traded on, on NASDAQ and the New York and uh, the stock exchanges, the U.S. stock exchanges. There's an enormous amount of cash that these companies have. Lots of companies, the top, Apple has a lot of cash. Uh, and Apple has enough cash that they can operate without investment. Remember, we saw that on the video. We've looked at the financial statements, and, and we can see that. So there's, there, uh, and I'll look at the, there's the top, there's probably about 10 companies that have about half of that uh, wealth. Uh, it's, the, you know, some enormous companies that we can buy stock in that have huge amounts of cash. So this investing 
activity on their statement of cash flow is really the most important one for them. Like I said, when Chrysler was bought by um, Mercedes, they had 600 million in cash. So I have yep. a question for you. Um, I don't know too much about the stock exchange or any of that, but I have $100,000 in Investopedia, right? Let's yep. say um, I put $100,000 in Apple, right? I buy 100000 That 100000 just went from me, that's their cash now, right? They can operate on that, they can, is that technically how that goes? It depends on what class of stock you bought. And I, I owe us all a better explanation than that. Let me come back and talk, let's talk about that. Because remember, he talked about, you know, there's the household that wants to invest and the company that wants the capital, but there's all this mess of in between that gets paid. So some of that is in the mess between that gets paid. And I'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, but in essence, yes, when there's a stock, uh, a, a, a new a share of stock that's issued, that money comes into the company. When, if I bought that share of stock that's issued, and I sell it to you, that money does not go into the company, it comes to me. It pays me back for the stock that I already paid them for. The company's already got their money for that certificate of stock. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, that, so that's why uh, initial public offerings are so attractive, or IPOs. IPOs are so attractive to a company that that day that Facebook went public, they went from having no, no outside money to every share of stock that they sold minus commissions for brokerage houses came to them, every dime of it. And so they raised $165 billion or something like that in one day. You know, that just, you know, I don't remember what it was, but it was an enormous amount of money. So the initial public offering, a company then can make a decision also uh, to issue new stock. And when they issue new stock, that goes to them. The, comp that the money for that, those shares of stock go to them. It also, it gets complicated because there's another thing that happens when they do that. When they issue new stock, they dilute the current shareholders. So if I had 10 shares of stock out and that added up to 100% of our company, and I decide that I like you and we want to issue uh, a, a couple shares of stock, then all the rest of us that had the 10 have to agree, uh, are you willing to let that go down to 8% instead of 10% of the company because we got another guy we want to issue some stock to? Uh, and if, if that dilutes us, now, there are people that hold stock that's non-dilutable stock, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, and it, we have an anti-dilution clause in some transactions of investment. Uh, it's another way that you can wipe out a partner. Not in a public company, you can't get by with this, but in a private company, you can. Let's say you have uh, three partners, and the partnership agreement is when you need cash, you put out a cash call and everybody has to put up the amount of the cash call to keep one-third, one-third, one-third ownership with the three partners. So we need a million bucks. All of you have to come up, you have to come up with 300,000 each in the round number. And, and, but let's say, I, let's say one of the partners I don't like anymore, uh, and, and I, I know they don't have tons and tons of cash, uh, I, can, I, can, I can do a cash call for more money than they have, so they can't perform that cash call and therefore they have to step back and take a smaller percentage of ownership. But if we really want to wipe them out, I can all of a sudden, instead of us having 1,000 shares of stock in our company, we can have a board meeting, because I'm chairman of the board, and I can issue 10 million new shares of stock. And you've still got the four that you had, <laughs> but now it's, it's not a quarter of the company, it's now a millionth of the company. So you still are in ownership, but I've wiped you out. And, and that can legally happen. It can illegally happen as well. Uh, but I've seen it done with a couple of the guys here in this town that you would know the names of that I've watched how they've done their partnerships and I've watched them take out partners that way. Uh, I, I have ethical problems with that, personally. Uh, I think that if, you, uh, if, you, you know, if you've got to dissolve a partnership, dissolve a partnership. Don't wipe a guy out who's been acting in good faith. But that's just my point of view on that. But it's legal to do in the way the stock structure is handled. So in your little company, if there are shares of stock to the company, you need some professional um, uh, input on how to handle that if you want to reward somebody, you, uh, you don't want to punish somebody, or if you do want to punish somebody and you feel ethically okay with that, then there are ways to do that 
legally that uh, the other party can't do anything about that can take them out. It has to do with kind of how that stock issue. Sorry, I didn't mean to get this off track. Well, that's kind of, it's kind of what we're here for, isn't it, though? We're, we're here to learn about this stuff because it is, um, it's complicated. And I, I invite questions all the time, so uh, when I don't know, we'll find out. But let's, let's read for five more minutes because we're almost done. We only got a couple pages of this, uh, and then we've got to go on break. Andrew. How cash flow is calculated. Now that you understand what compromises a cash flow statement and why it's important for financial analysis, here are two common methods used to calculate and prepare the operating activity section of cash flow statements. Direct method. First method used to calculate the operation section is called the direct method, which is based on the transactional information that is that impacted cash during that period. To calculate the operation section using the direct method, take all cl cash collections from operating activities and subtract all of the cash disbursements from the operating activities. Indirect method. The second way to prepare the operating section is the indirect method. This method depends on the accrual accounting method in which the accountant records revenues and expenses at times other than when cash was paid or received, meaning that these accrual, accrual ac entries and adjustments cause the cash flow from operating activities to differ from net income. Instead of organizing transactional data like the direct method, the accounting starts with the net income number found on the income statement and makes adjustments to undo the impact of the accruals made during the period. Essentially, the account will cover net income to actual cash flow by deaccruing it through a process to identify any non-cash expenses for the period from the income statement. The most common and consistent of these depreciation, sorry, the most common and consistent of these are depreciation the reduction in the value of an asset over time, and amortization, the spreading of payments over multiple periods. Okay, most of us, somewhere right about here, our eyes went crossed, <laughs> and somewhere by here, the brain shut down. That's accountant speak, mumbo jumbo. It was hard to read. How, and hard to even read, <laughs> much less to follow and understand. Hang in there, don't give up yet. This is an important thing for us to get to the numbers that matter. And so it's not important for us to be actually able to do a cash flow statement. It's important for somebody in our company to know how to do it. But it's important for us in the company to know how to read it. And so we're getting there. And we're gonna get there without having to go numb uh, and, 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 and try to translate every little piece of that. We'll translate a little bit of it, and I'm going to equate it to the water in the bathtub. And so we kind of know there's a drain and there's a spigot that fills it, and that's water in and water out. We can look at cash kind of that same way. The cash flow statement, and, you know, I, it, if there's a slow leak in the drain, we want to be able to pick that up. We know how much we put in, but we don't know how, you know, the level's dropping, and we don't know precisely why. That's what we can pick up in the cash flow statement. And that's important. That's something we want to be able to do. And, and most of us will not see uh, cash flow statements done by the direct method. That's the easiest one to produce. If you have a bookkeeper and you're asking for financial statements, that may be the one they do, and that may be the one uh, that QuickBooks spits out for you if you are on a cash basis. If you're a public company, you cannot be on a cash basis. You have to be, you must be on an accrual basis. And uh, we haven't even talked about the difference between cash and accrual. We'll, we, we'll circle back and I'll talk about that at a later time, uh, but, but there is a difference. The accrual basis is the moment at which a, a sale is agreed to and made, not when cash goes into your account necessarily. And, uh, so my understanding of, of accrual cash is uh, accrual is done by date. Okay. Rather, you know, more like a check register. Money comes in, Correct. money flows yeah. out, money comes in, money flows out. Yeah. And the uh, cash basis is, is uh, I had 
<laughs> when you think about it, spit it back out because we want to hear that. Because you're right. And th this is where a lot of uh, fraud occurs. Uh, people uh, claiming a sale in, we'll see that coming right up uh, in February 1st. Well, how long do you keep the books open? January. Uh, uh, and, 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 you know, when a sale that actually occurred in February, can you post it in January? No. On an accrual basis, you can't. It has to be posted when it happened, which is February. And, and so that brings up a question. Like you do, a, we do a job. We start the job in November last year. We don't get our payment on that job till the fifteenth of January the following year. Right. That kind of comes into play on the on the direct or the indirect, right? Yep. Oh, it, it totally does. And we have that on the farm every year. We plant the crop in. Uh, if you're growing wheat, you plant the crop in. Uh, one year and you reap it in another year, uh, and uh, and how do you how do you account for that if your fiscal year is in the middle? It, it, it requires a conversation, uh, and and uh, and there's not a law except that you it's justifiable and it's consistent. You always do it the same, and and that question came into play a similar question, not that one with that, but uh, timing the timing question came into play. I've mentioned Andrews Transportation. We talked with Andrews uh, quite a bit, and and at what point in time? Can Andrus bill for hauling a load, and and you think about it, you know they get the order, and the order says pick up a trailer full of stuff at at uh, Walmart distribution, and take it to uh, this is a this is a product line distribution here, and they they don't they don't ship to any stores, they ship to other DCs uh, that do ship to stores. So pick up a trailer here at Walmart distribution in Hurricane, run it up. Uh, to the DC in Grantsville uh, that does ship to Walmart stores and drop that trailer off and send us an invoice and we will pay you this much for that job. <clears throat> so at what point in time can Andrus call that ship when they pick the trailer up, when the trailer's in transit, when they drop the trailer, uh, or when Walmart says, yeah, uh, we unloaded the trailer? As soon as they hook on to it. Yeah. Say that again. As soon as they hooked on to it. Well, th that was what they wanted to do, and and they, they weren't doing that consistently through the company. When you hook on to it, uh, you know, is it prepaid? Paid for services rendered that they don't owe it until it's actually delivered, you know, or do they owe it while it's in transit? It's five hour drive, you know. So at what point, you know, we're splitting hairs on a day. But when you've got a fleet that's maybe shipping across the United States, you're no longer splitting hairs on a day. You simply have to define how you do it. And then you have to always do it that way. You can't do it part of the time one way and part of the time the other way because there's going to be a million dollars in the middle. And that can get easily unaccounted for and put in the pocket of an owner or put in the pocket of an accountant who's taking money from the owner. You know, so that's how that's done is by, by not treating those kinds of questions uh, the same across the board. We have more to read, but we're past break time. Let's take a break. I'll see you back at 7. Sure. Yeah, 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 that's fine. 
stock game and buy low and sell high that's and watch that, it. Watch that's it the go. objective, I guess. You're right. It's kind of hard to do that throughout the work day. Uh, well, you gotta just take the, the approach of, well, I bought it, and now I'm just not going to focus on it. I'm not going to about it. Like, I don't even look at it until we're in class and it gets brought up. And I, go, ah, I, I, I usually yeah, don't look at mine until Andrew and I are talking, and I'm like, hey, check this out. <laughs> <laughs> I just have a hard time looking at it because until I actually like get to class or get to my house, it's like eight o'clock at night, and then I actually look at the market and close. I can't. Yeah. Well, you can bad. you can still put orders in to move it tomorrow, yeah. and it'll send you an email when the when the, they've accepted your order and when uh, this place is in this media. Insane on the emails that they do. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. It's, it's I mean, I've set up two filters. And I don't care if I get the buy purchase ones because it was like six a day and just like junk emails. And that wasn't the purchase of emails. Yeah, I guess I filtered so them out right away so I didn't know what level yeah. they were. Uh, so. Yeah, I, I don't want to get that stuff either. With my 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 true account, my, my, my real money, I try not to look at it that often. Yeah. And, and I've got a guy who I trust that is looking at it all day, every day, and his team, that's what they're doing. And it's like, you know, if you want to get out of a position like a energy is iffy and in terms of the oil companies, and if you want to move out of that, talk to me about, about it and why, and we yeah. will do that. But you get the monthly statement, and sometimes that's a shock. It, the last year has been brutal for me. I've, uh, I've lost three quarters of a million dollars. Yeah, yeah. It's a point. My life hasn't always been that way. Can we talk about Warren Buffett, right, and his stock, Berkshire Hathaway? Um, how how far do you think it will crash when he does pass? Do you think Do you think it will go down? That's a really interesting question because he's been grooming Charlie. Uh, his name I forgot, but. Charlie's like two years younger than me. <laughs> 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 it's, 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 a, it's a broken success. He's got other guys on the team, uh, and I, I don't know. The market will definitely react. You know, and when you get, it'd probably be a good idea to short Berkshire Hathaway on the day you receive the news that he's passed. But I don't know, because I think it'll go down. But I don't know that it'll stay down because. It's not based on him anymore. You know, he's, okay. you know, it, it, it hasn't been for a while. You know, he, he's certainly there every day, and he's certainly the, when he speaks, everybody listens. Yeah, he definitely has power to move mountains. Yeah, but he's he's also a pretty good guy. He's a wise guy, a wise person, and and understands the impact that he he now has millions of households depending on their company. And so, and you look at it, you know, when you think about it, 
Warren Buffett dies, what's going to happen to Geico's portfolio? Anything? Nothing. Their insurance is the same as it was the day before. You know, there's no cost to change to them. There's nothing. So the company, Coca-Cola, what will happen to Coca-Cola if he, when he dies? You know, the market will get antsy. Right. But nothing will happen to Coca-Cola. They'll be fine, and you know, they'll may take a quarter to report their results. But I don't think that they'll have a long-term effect. Yeah. Some people that want to make profits will try to act jump in on there. Yeah. That they will. And they're, you know, when their stock price is at, I, I thought this simulator was going to let, let us buy fraction shares. Uh, and my brokerage does, so you can. You only have to have four hundred thirty-four thousand dollars to buy a share. Well, there's two stocks. There's yeah. an A and a B. That's correct. Yeah. I bought B because they're like three hundred fifty dollars a share. Yeah. And so far, I'm good to go on it. But if he dies, right? If he passes, what, what will happen? Yeah. What will happen to B because it is so low? Yeah. Right. Maybe that just goes away. I, and goes back to what are, I would guess the percentage is all of the issued stock will be within. You know, one of the examples of the difference between the, the classes of stock, um, I issued stock in our company to a investment uh, group out of uh, Fort, Fort Texas, they were oil guys, West Texas oil, and we needed money, they were, they were interested in what we were doing, and uh, they put money in, uh, we were willing to put money in on something that was a loan, but uh, they wanted an option to convert it to stocks. Stock. And the, that's called a convertible debenture, is what the term is for that. And the terms on how to convert or if to convert, who has the option to convert, are totally up to the negotiation. There's not a rule except that you define it. And so sometimes they leave it up to the company. I put this cash in. Uh, you have the option to decide to convert it to stock, in which case you keep the money. Or you have the option to pay it back. So if you're doing really well, you may choose to buy me, buy me back out. And you take the option that way. Uh, I may not want you to. If you're doing well, I may want to hang, I want, may want to have the stock. So maybe I don't want you to exercise that and convert it. So you have to decide who it is it decides. Which part? The, the receiver or the giver? And that's just the negotiation. But the vehicle is the same. And the stock that is intended is a separate issue. The separate class of stock at that point for us. So it didn't affect the rest of the shareholders at all uh, if that became uh, cash to us or it became a debt to us. It reflected on the balance sheet. It, it would hit our balance sheet at that, you know, whichever way that went. Uh, but it, uh, it didn't affect the, the shareholders. When you talk about splitting splitting stocks, like you mentioned that last week about yeah. AMD, what does that look like? It's different for every company. Um, a lot of times, when they make the announcement that they are going to split, and they say the price at which they're going to split and the day they're going to do it, trading is often halted between now and that day so that it's fixed. How many shares are out? Who owns those shares is, is fixed. And then depends on what the split looks like, whether they uh, sometimes they split want to buy some of the shares back. And so they cash out some of the split shareholders. So normally when a company splits their stock, is that just because they feel like their stock has been uh, reached a well, would it happen anytime like so let's take AMD for example, right? They uh, they have uh, CPUs and GPUs when they split, would they say, okay, now those two departments are different entities? They could. In that case, uh, they'd be two separate, separate companies, and they would have to issue holdings in both and add it up to the same. And they'd have to do that with some uh, agreed on formula. Because otherwise, you could say, you could cry foul and say, hey, they, they, they took the profitable half of the company. I, don't, I, I wanted that half. Right. You know, something. So they have to split that evenly or fairly. So in what so let's say a company decides not to split or branch out in different departments, right? But they want to split their stock. What in what circumstances would they do that? Sometimes they feel or felt maybe that their price their stock was priced 
at a point that was inhibiting people from wanting to buy it because Pepsi stock is at 20 bucks and Coke's at 40 bucks, 60 bucks, 80 bucks. People that don't understand just go, why is Pepsi so cheap? And they saw, and they, they're not basing it on any facts at all. It's a perception of the buyer. And so the company may say, well, let's split so we get our price down the same as the competitors of, of, of stock because we think that's impacting who who's purchasing. Yeah. Gotcha. And, and that's a guessing game and a marketing game. Really definitely. Usually there's no, uh, there's no compelling reason why a company has to split, except to ratchet back the number for the, for the shares trade. Accessibility. Accessibility. And, and that goes, reflects back on a time when, when you couldn't buy half a share. You had to buy a whole share. And, and today, there are people willing to sell you half of the share for fee. Right. You know, or a quarter or a tenth or whatever. You know, so that's a, a whole new way of trading, and that has an impact on one company's book. They, they may not need to as much as at one time they did to get the price down to something. Right. right. The value is still the same if you look at percentage of the company. Right. It doesn't matter whether you got it. You know, what's one share? Is it one half of the company or? One percent of the company, or two hundred of the company, or two thirds. Yeah. Right. So if you own ten shares in a company and they decide to split stocks, let's say you have ten percent. When they split, you still have ten percent. If you are, if you have a, a non diluted, non diluted uh, agreement with them, yeah. Uh, otherwise, uh, you still should wind up with ten percent if they split the stock and give you twice as many shares. Uh, they're just worth half as much. Right. I mean, that's all just a numbers game. In Monopoly, it makes no difference at all. Just, right. you know. So in the real world, it kind of doesn't make that difference. Either. We all back? We haven't been for a while. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, we are only a couple, two slides from done on sticking the cash flows. And then we're going to do something a little bit. Uh, we'll, we'll hopefully watch a shorter video, and, and I want to get us involved in the handouts that we have. So uh, let's continue to uh, how we read a cash flow statement. We're at Josie. Cash flow statements can reveal what phase of business is in, whether it's rapidly growing, start startup and miniature, and profilable uh, company, profitable company. It can also reveal whether a company is going through transition or in a state of decline. As a manager, you might look at a cash flow statement to understand how your particular department is contributing to your company's health and well-being. And use that insight to adjust your team's activities. Cash flow might also impact international decisions, internal decisions such as budgeting or whether to hire or fire employees. Uh, uh, Microsoft is doing well. We just talked about that. Uh, they're laying off 10,000 people. And right now they are? Right, what's that? They are right now? Right now, they are. Wow. Yeah, and, and so does that mean the company's in trouble or does that mean it's being managed well? Look at their statement of cash flow, they got cash. That seems to be a management decision. And, and that's to try to stay ahead of the curve, right? Not wait till it's too late when you go, oh wow, we got 100,000 more people than we need to operate the business the way we're operating. And when, I don't know how many they have total, 200,000 employees. So 10,000 isn't that much of their aggregate workforce, but it still sends a shockwave through the market and maybe has an effect on stock prices. Okay, types of cash flow, Eli. Types of cash flow. Cash flow is typically depicted as being positive or negative. Here's what those designations mean. Positive cash flow. Positive cash flow indicates that a company has more money flowing into the business than out of it over a specific over a specified period. This is an ideal situation because having an excess of cash allows the company to reinvest in itself and its shareholders, settle debt payments, and find new ways to grow the business. Positive cash flow does not necessarily translate to profit. Growth business can be profitable without being cash flow positive, and you can have positive cash flow without actually making a profit. Negative cash flow. Having negative cash flow means your cash outflow is higher than your cash inflow during the period, but it doesn't necessarily mean profit is lost. Negative cash flow may instead be caused by expenditure and income mismatch, which should be addressed as soon as possible. 
negative cash flow may also be caused by your company's decision to expand and invest in future growth. So it's important to analyze changes in cash flow from one period to another, which can indicate how the business is performing overall. This is the game that's being played by the farmers when I was talking about in plant your wheat and uh, you fertilize or you do certain things that you know, are ne create negative cash flow in the fall uh, because maybe this is a new field, new crop, new area, maybe last year in the spring you weren't harvesting wheat, maybe you were planting beans. And, and so you had investment in the spring, uh, you had a profit to offset that investment in, in the fall, and now in the winter you put all this money into converting to wheat. And so now you put a whole bunch of investment in, you're going to have negative cash flow that year. But hopefully the following year, you're going to reap a harvest that you don't have to pay the expenses of planting or fertilizing. And, and so uh, that next year you may have positive cash flow. So you've got to look at the big picture of what and why uh, the money's going south or north, uh, depending on the thing. Uh, business insight, Randy. Cash flow statement example. Here's an example of a cash flow statement for your year that ended on March 30th, 2020. This cash flow statement tells you, one, the company started the year with approximately 10.75 billion in the cash in equivalent. Two, it brought in 53.66 billion through its regular operating activities. Three, it spent approximately 33.77 billion in the investment activities. Four, in the addition to investment activities, it spent a further 16 million, 38 billion in a financing activities making for a total cash outflow of 50.15 billion. Five, the company ended the year with a positive cash flow of 3.51 billion, the total cash flow of 14.26 billion. So, they pumped a lot of money in, they kept some, and you can see that now. We talked about the three uh, areas that are reported in a uh, statement of cash flows. The operating activities, that's the business that we're in. That's the crushing rocks, uh, blowing them up out of the ground, whatever it is that, 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 that goes into how you do that, how you get them there, picking them up with a loader, uh, putting them on a conveyor, putting the conveyor across the gully, uh, you know, crushing them, make a pile, sorting them, whatever uh, things you do, those are the operating activities that lead up to being able to sell dump trucks full of your product, uh, road, uh, road pack or sand, whatever it is that comes out of that. The investing activities say uh, may, we need to, uh, we need to uh, buy some more equipment. We've got, we've got more opportunity here. Or uh, when, you, when you go by uh, the, uh, uh, the gravel operations on I-15, when you pass Point of the Mountain going into Salt Lake, you know where that the hang gliders are all at there. Uh, there's a bunch of gravel pits right there, and and uh, uh, the reason they are there is that rock that comes out of that that point of the mountain. That rock uh, fractionates in fractures in a specific way. It's brittle, and so it doesn't form round pebbles and round rocks. It when you crush it, it forms sharp edges on the rock. And those sharp edges are really good in concrete because they make the concrete stronger. It's like kind of having a little reinforcement of the rock. Round rock is needed in concrete, but it's not near as good as fractured rock is. So those three companies that, that take gravel out of that and have been now, as long as I can remember, uh, the freeway used to go right by the edge of that. And you know now it's further and further away from the freeway when you go by there. So every year, they have to move their operation. What does it cost you to move one of those things? A lot, right? I mean, you stop doing everything. That's when people get hurt, too, because they're doing something that they're not usually doing, and they're moving their pit back closer to the mountain because they, they're allowed to take so many cubic yards of material out of that mountain based on their lease contract uh, from the, uh, the state of Utah that owns that, that mountain. And so investing activities would be involving moving their pit because you know, they, 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 they need different different gear to transport it uh, the way it gets transported. They had to move a railroad track, right? Because there's rail access to that. So you got to move a railroad track every now and then when you do that. And then financing is, you know, how did they how did they pay for that? You know, they had to borrow some money to do that, and there's interest costs on that. And are you operating on your own cash? 
or are you operating on uh, debt financing and equity financing to, to get the money to do all of that? And so that's what's reflected in the statement of cash flows. So I, yes? Did you tell me that in the investing activities, is that would be where I would show my dump trucks, my loaders, my track trucks, purchasing that stuff, or is that in the operation activities? I'd want to look at your total picture before I'd answer that, because uh, there will be a tax implication on that to you. And uh, the, when we looked at the thing called amortization, one of the things that's beautiful about amortization is that's an expense. But you, you all are familiar with this. That's, just a, that's, a, that's a bookkeeper accounting term that our brain doesn't really wrap around until you think about you are on an amortization schedule on the house that you bought. You've got a loan on your house, and you pay for your house amortized over 20 years. Maybe you got a 30-year loan on your house. So if you, here's, here's part of the advantage. It's not answering your question yet. But uh, if you're buying a new house, you're going to get a loan on the house. Uh, and you want to you want to put uh, automatic Venetian blinds on the house so that you know when the sun comes up the blinds go up or whatever you know you want to have that and you want a pool a pool in the backyard now you can buy all those things after you close on your house but if you finance them with your house the cost of your pool now is amortized over 30 years so let's say it's a three thousand dollar pool not counting cost of money you're paying what hundred bucks a year for your pool. And let's say you only live in the house four years, so you've paid 400 bucks for having a pool in your backyard. Somebody else is going to pay the rest of that because you've amortized it out legally and appropriately. So companies will do that too. The dump trucks might be on an amortization schedule, so you keep paying for them later instead of paying tax on, and paying for them now. So it, it's, it's so if you have the money and you you know have a big tax liability, you'd want to probably pull your own cash out if you needed a. If, or look for another way to write it off. Yeah, you're gonna want. Yeah, if you've got if you've got a tax problem and you have money, then you're gonna want to play Donald Trump and figure out how to hide it in such a way you don't have to pay taxes on it. And there are many legal ways to do that. And there's more illegal ways to do that as well. So you want to, you want to be careful in how you do that. Um, a lot of the, give you an example. We 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 saw uh, we see sports figures starting a charity and you know how 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 wonderful human beings they are and they got this charity going on and, and they're giving away this and they're giving away that yeah they got a 30 million dollar contract which means they have a 10 million dollar tax problem so they can write off the charity so that that some of that 10 million instead of going to the irs goes to soldiers without legs or some some wonderful thing that it should go to right but so you know, Jeremy Johnson here in town, when he was under scrutiny, uh, earth, earthquake in Haiti, flies a helicopter to Haiti uh, to help the relief e efforts, and he comes back a hero. Now, I'm not taking sides here. He had a tax problem, and uh, an airplane flight to Haiti and donating the use of a helicopter for a period of time in, a, in an international crisis is good press, good PR, and a great tax write-up. So, so, you know, Tax implications are, 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 they hit everybody. And people do things, a lot of times you think they're altruistic in what they're doing and they're really motivated by money. Uh, they want to save a little tax money in what they're doing. Uh, your, your scenario is you, you need good advice to think through how to I do guess it. the answer to my question would be it could go in either one. Yes. Whatever is best. Yes. Your yes. Yeah. Uh, if you put it in one, one year, and put it in another, another year, it will be a note on your financial statement that your auditor may not approve because it may be a place you could hide some. And, and so for an investor, in your personal company, it's fine. All you have to fool is the IRS. An investment company, or I mean a public company, you have to fool your shareholders. You have to satisfy them. That's a better way than saying fool them. That's not objective. Uh, and with a partnership, a family business. You know, you got the brother that's thinking you're doing this for gain, and you just got to be consistent in how you post it. And, and, it, and people have to understand it, explain it. Uh, but there probably will be a better way and a worse way for you this year, next year, you know, that kind of thing. So, you know, it's like investing in your retirement. You invest now, it's tax-free dollars, tax-free win. You already paid tax on it. Now you're gonna, is it gonna be tax-free when you pull it out? Uh, that's a question if you have a capital gain or not. These are kinds of things that, that go beyond uh, just a quick look at. So we gotta put the thinking hats on to do that. All right, um, let's, uh, we're done with cash flow statements for this second in time. 
I want a little video clip on uh, uh, statement to cash flow. See it again, and uh, maybe understand it a little bit better as we get multiple exposures to something. And then I'm going to get us into the handout that we've got. So. Um, I think we'll go with uh, I'm James, you're watching Accounting Stuff, and in this video, we'll go over the cash flow statement for beginners. A cash flow statement is a financial statement that summarizes a business's cash inflows and outflows over a period of time. We'll get into how that works in a moment, but first, why do we need a cash flow statement? In accounting, there are two main methods for preparing your books, the cash method and the accrual method. With the cash method, you recognize your revenue when cash is received and you record your expenses when cash is paid out. But under the accrual method, you recognize revenue as it's earned and record your expenses as they are incurred. So what does that mean? If you're cash accounting, then technically you only have one financial statement. The income statement. It summarizes your revenues and expenses over a period of time, leaving you with a profit or a loss. But with the cash method, we said that you recognize revenue when cash is received and you record expenses when cash is paid out. That leaves you with a net cash inflow or an outflow. So the income statement prepared under the cash method is equivalent to a cash flow statement. Keep that in mind, we'll come back to it later. Plenty of small businesses do their books this way, which is fine, but the cash method isn't allowed under IFRS or GAAP. If you're following either of these, then you must use the accrual method. So there was a big, big fire in the St. George Industrial Park uh, a number of years ago. I don't remember what year the fire was, but I remember the fire burned, burned a company to the ground. And that company, uh, it, the, the, the place is just past the sleeping bag manufacturer. Yeah. Uh, they don't make sleeping bags anymore there either. Uh, it's just a warehouse operation. Just going up from IFA one block, it, it was a company on the right hand side that burnt to the ground. And they they built houses. And they, they had an interesting model that I've not seen many people be able to do and, and uh, uh, stay up with it. Uh, they were mixing within the company the cash method and the accrual method. And what they were doing is this. They were building houses for people under contract. They were building them well. They were building them fast. And they would borrow all of the materials because they had 30 days credit with their suppliers. So does that make sense to you so far? Your, your supplier could send you stuff and you would promise to pay them in 30 days. So that's on the accrual method. Uh, you, you take revenue as it's earned on paper, uh, like the day you close. The bank doesn't put the money in your account on the day you close. That's just the closed. You signed all the documents and the deal's done. But the money has to move. And so when money actually goes in your pocket is later, especially like if you're a realtor and you sold the house, you know, you earned your money at closing, but you didn't get paid at closing. Somebody else got paid at closing. Uh, you post your expenses as they are incurred, not when you pay cash out. Those are two different times. So they would get materials to build the house. They would owe Burton Lumber, you know, forty thousand dollars for the material on the house. They would go out real fast and build the house, and they would close within thirty days. So they didn't owe Burton Money Lumber their money yet, but they're closing. They required a cash closing. That was the stipulation of the house: is they had to get cash the day they closed. And that cash had to be in the form of cash cash, right? I mean, not a pot, suitcases full of money, but, but money in the account. So if they got money in the account on stuff that they borrowed over here on the cruel method, they could real quick pay that Burton Lumber off 
for that house and never have to pay any interest costs themselves, right? Is that, is that how that, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And that was by mixing cash method and accrual method. They were collecting on the cash method uh, and they were paying their vendors on the accrual method. Now, that's tricky to do as a company. I'm not suggesting to do that. The name of that company was Aquarius. They went in the wood business. They became eventually Cabinetech in another lifestyle after the fire. Uh, but but in, the, in the days, in the very early days of the company, that's how they were operating that company. And many of you know the people and the players of that, uh, and they were successful in doing that. It's hard to build a house in 30 days. Uh, uh, Salisbury's been doing it here for five years. They've been building a house a day, uh, and closing a house a day for five years. Add that number up and look at the building permits they've turned through, and watch the way they build a house. I, I, w I can talk about Salisbury a little bit in an another class, uh, about a few things that are unique to the <coughs> business model. And so a couple of you are interested in the construction business, um, one of whom is listening. Um, Elizabeth was here sitting in this chair and she's been uh, uh, communicating on, uh, on our videos um, and is, is still current with the class. And, and uh, um, in the construction business, in the construction business, this is hard to do. It's very difficult to uh, push the timelines because uh, you, you've, got, you've got to really manage your business lean. And if I, I know where the current site is at, uh, I can point you to the address where uh, Salisbury does all the framing for your homes, for example. And that's not done on site. That's not done on the lot you're building a home on. It's done <coughs> nearby. Uh, and it's done, they stack them up, and they'll, uh, they've got everything pre-cut, even the outlet holes on the, on the framing, so that everything is to your house and the day that they, the concrete is cured enough that they can put a frame on it, uh, they have you framed by lunchtime. The entire house is framed by lunchtime. And to be able to do that, you've got to have a system. And you've got to be, man and that system has some costs and some perks to it. One of the perks is you're able to manage cash a lot tighter and a lot faster. Your cash is churning, the merry-go-round is spinning faster in your business. And so, um, there's, there's other things about that, and we could maybe talk that, about that in a different class. Right now, I'm just uh, focusing on what he put together here as a difference between the two. He did say that most companies, uh, small businesses, are on the cash method. That's the way I do it in my house, right? I've either got the money in my pocket or I don't. If I don't have the money on my pocket, in my pocket, I can't go to the movie. You know, I can't finance the movies. You know, I mean, I guess you can. You put on credit card. But, you know, uh, we tend to operate our own business and uh, 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 our own life uh, on the cash. So revenue must be recognized as it's earned and expenses must be recorded as they are incurred. In accrual accounting, we still have the income statement, but this time it represents what a business has earned and incurred, not its cash inflows and outflows. So it's not equivalent to a cash flow statement. So. Businesses using the accrual method keep a separate cash flow statement alongside their income statement, and they also keep a balance sheet which holds their assets, their liabilities, and their equity. Not long ago, I made videos covering the income statement and the balance sheet. You can find links to both of those down in the description. What is a cash flow statement? At the start, I said it summarizes a business's cash inflows and outflows over a period of time. But what does it look like? We begin with the opening cash amount at the start of the period and compare it against the closing cash amount at the end of the period. You can find both of these numbers in the balance sheet. The movement between the two is the net increase or decrease in cash. And once we know that, then we can get onto the real purpose of the cash flow statement, explaining how we ended up here. There are three main sections, cash flow from operating activities, cash flow from investing activities, and cash flow from financing activities. Operating activities are the main revenue generating activities of the business. These are the cash flows involved in selling goods or services. Investing activities sit outside of the business's core operations. They involve the buying or selling of investments or other long-term assets. And finally, financing activities relate to funding the business through raising or repaying cash to third-party banks or the owners of the business. This, my friends, is the basic structure of the cash flow statement. Positive numbers represent cash inflows and negative numbers are cash 
outflows. Now there are a couple of ways to make a detailed cash flow statement. We can use the direct method or the indirect method. We'll start with the direct method. Cash flow from operating activities under the direct method mirrors the income statement prepared under the cash method, which we saw earlier. At the top, we have cash receipts from customers, which mirrors revenue. And then we have the cash paid out to suppliers and employees, and then interest and taxes paid. Collectively, these mirror the business's expenses. Cash flow from investing activities includes cash outflows from buying investments or other long-term assets and the cash inflows that come with selling them. Cash flow from financing activities relates to the raising or repaying of cash or capital. There are two ways a business can do this, using liabilities or equity. They can borrow money from a third party bank, which would increase their liabilities, or a business can look to its owners, its shareholders, who can make capital contributions, which increase equity. On the flip side, they also make loan repayments back to the bank and distribute dividends back to the owners. When we add up the net cash flows from operating, investing and financing activities, we can reconcile the net increase or decrease in cash back to the movement in the balance sheet. Now, how does the indirect method work? The only section that changes is cash flow from operating activities. We use three steps to work it out. The indirect method always begins with the net profit or loss from the income statement. Then in step two, we add back all the non-cash expenses that appear above it. These don't represent cash outflows and they need to be reversed out. The usual suspects are depreciation and amortization and any gain or loss on the sale of non-current assets or long-term assets. Finally, we adjust for the movement in working capital. Working capital is the difference between current assets and current liabilities. Increases in current assets like inventory or receivables reduce cash flow, whereas increases in current liabilities like payables increase cash flow. You can find all of these numbers on the comparative balance sheet. Now you're probably thinking that the direct method sounds a lot easier. Why don't we just use that? You're right, it is easier to read, but it's actually harder for accountants to prepare. So we don't use it as much. The indirect method is much, much easier to work out because we can find a lot of these numbers in the income statement and the balance sheet, as you'll see in this next example. I realise that there's a lot going on here, so I've put together two cheat sheets covering the direct and the indirect cash flow statement. I like to think of them as one page reference guides to help you out. If you'd like to support the channel, then you're welcome to buy them on my website. The link, as usual, is up here and down there. How do we make a cash flow statement? Yes, it's time for that example, and we'll be using the indirect method because it's easier. We'll need a couple of things to get started. First, we need an income statement. Here's one for a business called Tumble, which is a fictional dating app. We actually made this one from nothing in the income statement video, so check that out and maybe click subscribe as well. It summarizes Tumble's revenues and expenses for the year ended December 31st. And here's Tumble's balance sheet, which we made in the balance sheet video. It shows us a snapshot of their assets, liabilities, and equity at the end of the year. But hold on, we're using the indirect method, so we actually need to see last year's balance sheet as well. So this is Tumble's comparative balance sheet. We have the current year one on the left and last year's one on the right. Nice. One more thing before we begin. Here are some key facts which happened during the year. Tumble sold some furniture for $10,000, which originally cost them $20,000 and had been depreciated by $5,000. The loss on the sale was charged to general and admin expenses. Tumble also spent $910,000 on computer equipment. They raised $100,000 in long-term debt and made no repayments. And finally, they issued $50,000 in common stock and paid out $1 million in dividends. Righto, let's begin. What are we reconciling? Cash. This is a cash flow statement after all, so let's head over to Tumble's comparative balance sheet. We can see that they held $13,895,000 in cash at the end of last year, and this number increased to $17 million at the end of this year. So we can lift these numbers and place them at the bottom of our indirect cash flow statement. Overall, that's a net increase in cash 
$3,105,000. But how did Tumble pull this off? Let's find out. We'll start with cash flow from operating activities. In step one, we need to find Tumble's net profit or loss for the current year. That's easy, we can get it from the income statement. On the bottom line, we can see that Tumble earned $9,650,000 this year from their core operations. We'll take Tumble's net profit and put it right at the top of cash flow from operating activities. Step two, we need to reverse out all of the non-cash expenses. Non-cash expenses appear above the bottom line in the income statement. Some classic examples are depreciation and amortization. These represent the gradual process of writing off long-term assets. They aren't cash flows. This year, Tumble incurred $850,000 in non-cash expenses. So we'll add this back in our cash flow from operating activities. But that's not all. Tumble made a loss on the sale of long-term assets. If we jump back to our key facts page, we said that they sold some furniture for $10,000. So let's quickly do some workings. This furniture originally cost Tumble $20,000. And by the time it was sold, it had incurred $5,000 in depreciation, leaving it with a carrying value of $15,000. Tumble sold this furniture for $10,000, which left them with a loss on the sale of $5,000. This is also a non-cash expense, and it was charged to general and admin expenses in the income statement. We need to reverse it out in our cash flow statement. So we'll add back the loss on the sale of furniture of $5,000. Step three we need to adjust for the movement in Tumble's working capital. Working capital is the difference between current assets and current liabilities. Ignoring cash, current assets are typically made up of inventory and receivables, and current liabilities are payables. We can find the movement in all of these on Tumble's comparative balance sheet. It doesn't look like Tumble has any inventory, but they do have some receivables. Accounts receivable, other receivables and prepaid expenses, which add up to $40,050,000 in the current year and $8,850,000 last year. That's an increase in receivables of 5.2 million during the year. An increase in receivables reduces cash flow. So we subtract $5.2 million from cash flow from operating activities. I like to think of it this way. If receivables have gone up, then Tumble is owed more money which isn't good for cash flow. Payables work in a similar way. Tumble has accounts payable, taxes payable, accrued expenses, and some deferred revenue. All of this adds up to $14.4 million in payables in the current year. And last year, they had $14,850,000 in payables. That's a year on year decrease in payables of $450,000. We subtract decreases in payables under cash flow from operating activities. Because if payables go down, then more supplier accounts have been settled, so there's less cash. When we take Tumble's profit, add back their non-cash expenses, and adjust for the movement in working capital, then we can see that they had a net cash inflow of $4,855,000 from operating activities. Couple more things we need to do here to finish this off. But first, I'd like to say a big thanks to all my channel supporters. You guys motivate me to keep on making more accounting tutorials. If you'd like to sign up, then you can click the join button. Next up is cash flow from investing activities. We're done with operating activities, so the rest of the cash flow statement is the same, whether you're using the direct or the indirect method. On our key facts page, we can see that Tumble spent $910,000 on computer equipment. This is a cash outflow from investing activities because they bought long-term assets. But Tumble also sold a long-term asset. Remember that furniture we talked about? Tumble made a loss on its sale, which we called a non-cash expense. We added it back in cash flow from operating activities, but we also need to record the cash receipt on the sale of $10,000. This sale isn't part of Tumble's core business, so we record it as a cash flow from investing activities. When we total it against the purchase of computer equipment, that leaves us with a net cash flow from investing activities of $900,000. This time it's a cash outflow, so the number's negative. 
Cash flow from financing activities. Financing activities involve raising or repaying cash or capital used to fund a business. On the key facts page, we can see that Tumble raised $100,000 in long-term debt. This is a liability to a third-party bank, and this year they made no debt repayments. They issued $50,000 in common stock, which is a capital contribution from the shareholders who own the business, which increases equity, and they paid $1 million out in dividends back to the shareholders. That would have decreased their equity. We can pull all these numbers through into cash flow from financing activities. Tumble received $100,000 in cash from long-term debt. They've raised another $50,000 in equity, and they paid out $1 million in dividends. So that's a net cash outflow from financing activities of $850,000. Almost there. When we total the cash flows from operating activities, investing activities, and financing activities, we can see that Tumble had a net increase in cash of $3,105,000 during the year. This matches the movement in cash that we saw in the balance sheet. So we've reconciled this cash flow statement using the indirect method. Oh yeah! Hope you found that helpful. Let me know in the comments what you'd like to see next time. Bye for now. So that still our eyes are crossed and our brain is numb and we're a little going, okay. Uh, so we understand a little bit better how it is built up. Uh, we don't want to do it, but we want to read it. And so we're not there yet. We're getting there, but we're, get, we're there as far as this class is concerned. We'll finish up on how to read that next class, I want to go to the handout. And this is, this is I, 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 I don't want us to finish the handout today. I want us to get started and understand it and, and look into it. And, and then uh, this is the beginning of how we use finances to drive our businesses. I want to shut that kind of down at the moment uh, and uh, turn the lights back. The handout that we have uh, has a front sheet on it, and then it has a storyline that I want us to get to. But on the front sheet, we're looking at this is where we want to be at the end of the quarter uh, or the end of the semester. We want we want to be able to strongly manage our finances, whether it's a small company that we're running out of our garage, maybe it's your eBay business, uh, maybe it's. Uh, a company that you work for, or maybe you're going big and going all in on a company that's going to become public. Uh, anyway, we want to go through strong financial management and have the tools to do that. The process that we're going to do is threefold. We're going to learn how to analyze what we have. We've been learning how to read them, uh, learning a little bit about what they are. Uh, then we're going to, once we, once we analyze what we have in the rearview mirror, we want to do a diagnosis. Where's the company at? Are we in trouble? Or are we growing? Are there going to be some issues from growing? Um, where are we? Just the diagnosis of where we are. And then how do we drive this bus, the future planning? What do we do to get to where our targets are at or where we want to be? So in order to do those, there are uh, some activities that we are just going to start right now. Uh, in the analysis, we're going to spread the financial statement. And you don't know what that means quite yet, but we're going to dive in and do it. We're going to then calculate the ratios. You saw one ratio up there so far on the video called working capital. That's not a line item on any of the financial statements. You have to figure out from a ratio of where working capital is at. You have to read the financial spreadsheet and, and then calculate the ratios. And then you're going to look at trends. These are trends in the rearview mirror of what has been going on trend-wise this year, last year, and the year before. Maybe you go back five years, doesn't matter. Uh, you're going to look at the trends and compare one year to the other to say, we're doing stronger, we're doing worse, why? Either way. Uh, then on the diagnosis, we are going to identify the problem areas. How? From the financial statements that we're reading. 
We're going to identify where the problem areas are at. We are then going to calculate what is the financial impact of that thing we identified, positive or negative. We're going to determine what caused that and look at cause and effect. And, and to give you a glimpse at, glimpse at that, uh, the next to last sheet, page 11 on this handout, is a cause and effect chart to kind of show you, you know, kind of how this makes sense. If it turns out we have a low profit, the bottom left, bottom right hand corner, it's got five arrows pointing back on what could be causing that. And we're going to look out at how to sort those out and see what's causing low profit in this company that we're looking at, uh, if, if, that's, if that in fact is the case. Uh, and then we're going to make recommendations. This is what you would do if you are a consultant. And this is what you should be doing if you are on a management team. You should be looking at the history and making recommendations about what we're doing next. And that recommendation may be just a, a talk around the kitchen table with your husband, your wife, and saying, here's what we're doing to drive this thing in the direction we want to go. It might be a, a staff meeting, uh, a management meeting. It might be in a... Um, uh, a corporate uh, planning scenario. Um, Ken Kanabersky is is uh, the plant manager of RS Technologies here in town. Uh, many of you know Ken. He's talked here at the at the school, and his daughter has worked here at uh, Dixie Tech. Uh, Ken was the plant manager of Blue Bunny Ice Cream when they were here. Uh, he was plant manager of Lighthouse Foods. Uh, he was plant manager of Dairy Farmers of America, the ice cream factory again after leaving town on a couple of stints. Uh, so he has a history of, of managing, and uh, that's not accidental. Uh, today, and he's at RS Technologies uh, today, managing that company. Those are three completely different types of businesses, right? They're, the only similarity is they all have three or 400 employees. Other than that, they're, I mean, the Lighthouse and, and Ice Cream are both in the food industry, but, but composite, Telephone poles, light poles, that's not. It's nothing like it at all. Completely different thing. But driving the business is exactly the same. And this week, Ken's in Houston, Texas, with the management team from Toronto uh, that owns the company and operates the company here, and they're doing this. That's a normal thing for company management to do. Looking through the rearview mirror, seeing what they've done. Now, they've, they've had capital expenditures like crazy that are going to have to be comp accounted for you know, over time. They, they bought the old Firecon building, one of the biggest buildings in Washington County. And that had to be expensive. And they put all kinds of uh, carbon fiber winding equipment, automatic, robotic, in there. That had to be expensive. Uh, they didn't sell that many light bulbs this year. So how are they counting for what they've spent what it's producing, they're ramping up, they're trying to double their, their production facility right now as well. Uh, so they'll be hiring, by the way, just for uh, what's it worth. That's one more company stealing your employees away. Uh, so, uh, so treat them right, uh, try to keep your employees, uh, or go talk to Ken, I, you know, whichever way that might go. Uh, but my point is, the management teams in Houston, Texas this week, talking about this for their company. And you want to wonder, you know, if your company's not doing that, you're leaving a lot to luck. You know, hopefully we are uh, doing that. Uh, and then the future planning is uh, what do, this says project income statements, project balance sheet, project ratios, project cash flows. That's the same word as project, but it's pronounced project in this case because we are looking into the future saying what is next year's cash flow going to be? What is next year's financial statement going to look like? We are going to project, predict, and try to drive to that. And in a public company, this is critical because we are going to put that in our 10K annual report, and our investors are going to buy our stock based on that projection. Jake bought AMD because they said they're going to do this, this, and this. And that's a projection. And if they don't do this, this, and this, 
Jake Sarah might get him fired. He might say, sell off and say, I'm not air anymore. I'm out. Right? And it would have every right because you failed to do what you said you're going to do. And in a public company, you can't afford to do that. In a private company, those people are your friends and relatives. And you don't want to disappoint them either, right? You know, we're, we're, we're still trying to make mom happy. You know, no matter how old we get, we, we want to satisfy the people that have counted on us. And if it's friends and family, this gets really dicey. It's very easy to disappoint them. So our projections become much more critical because one of the things we're doing on those projections is we're paying people based on that. And we got people that need a raise, deserve a raise. And if we're going to factor that in, we need to project how am I going to pay for their raise. I've got to do certain things in this company in order to pay for that additional overhead. I'm going to hire 10 more people. How are we going to pay for that? These numbers should tell us how to do that. And that's how, that's how uh, granularly we want this to be so we can drive the company based on our analysis. So let's, look, let's read the story uh, uh, together that kind of sets this up on page two. It's titled Vegas Supply, Landon Red Last. Brad, you're on. All righty. <clears throat> Vegas Supply situation, Bud Ryan, no relation to ex Chicago Bears coach Buddy Ryan, opened Vegas Supply five years ago just before the SARS CoV 2 virus shut down the world. Over the years, he has been pleased with its performance in spite of the business issues associated with the crippling COVID 19 pandemic. Although modest sales and profits have steadily increased, recently, however, Bud has been having disturbing conversations with his banker. The bank keeps pestering him about reducing his bank debt. It has tripled in the last three years. Consequently, the bank continually urges Mr. Ryan to hire a financial consultant to help him analyze his business and correct its financial condition. Mr. Ryan adamantly complains that he doesn't need the help of some so-called expert he knows how to run his business, which is attested by the fact that the business continues to grow and has always been profitable. The company engaged in the wholesale speciality building material business business carries the following product lines, trim lumber, plumbing, electrical, fancy brick, stucco, and a variety of other building supplies. Sales are primarily to residential builders and special order hardware supply stores. Convinced that an independent opinion will support his cause, but finally concedes and hires you to examine his operation and make any appropriate recommendations. Okay, we're going to put ourselves in the shoes of the consultant that asked to go in and look at Vegas Supply. I first learned about this practice when Zion's Bank told me, uh, I think I shared that with you, the CEO of the company, and they didn't trust me. They didn't think I knew what I was doing, but I think they were right. And, and uh, 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 they said, you got to talk to one of our consultants. <laughs> and uh, they sent me off to one of their consultants in Seattle. And I talked to him. And uh, we became friends. He talked to me. He helped me. Uh, he helped Zion Bank. He helped the shareholders. I learned a lot in that, that journey. Uh, and I'm going to share as much of that with you as I can. And this is, this is the place that it starts. Bud didn't think his company needed help. I've gone into, I probably would say, hundreds of companies at this point under similar circumstances. They, the company was on paper in pretty good shape, but somebody on the team said, let's double check or let's get help, or in some cases the companies were sliding and they needed some turnaround help. And in uh, some cases the company were poor, companies were healthy but poised for growth, maybe big growth in some cases, and they wanted to know that they were going to go about that growth the right way. So I will say this right now, for those of you that are uh, contemplating this consulting role that we're, we're putting you in right now, uh, consulting role looking at <coughs> financial statements, it's much, much easier to manage a financial turnaround. A company that is broke, is getting foreclosed on, has crashed or has not yet locked their doors, but that's in big trouble, it's easier to manage that than it is to manage a company that is profitable and is growing quickly. Growth is very, very hard to manage. And part of the reason growth is very hard to manage is that everybody thinks everything's going great. 
and it kind of is. I mean, you you know, uh, you're you're magically adding customers. You're magically things are working in your product line, and, and you've got more and more opportunity. But it costs money to serve those opportunities, and managing that, the allocation of capital. Remember, that's that's what the CEO's job is: is the proper allocation of capital. How do you feed the growth? That means you have to say no to something, and knowing what to say no to and how to say no is a dicey job because everybody's enthusiastic and everybody everybody's thinking things are magically good and they don't want to be said no to their thing. So as you manage the growth, you know they want you to fund it all, uh, especially the stuff that has to do with their department or their their team, and and so managing growth becomes very difficult. Managing turnaround. That's hard, but for a different reason, and it's easier than managing growth. It's hard because you've got other people that don't believe in you. But usually you have a core group within that company that built it. And they believe in themselves. They know they crashed and they had a reason that it happened, and they wish they could get some help because they want to turn it around and they want to keep going with the core product of what they're doing. And so you have everybody's 100% full attention when you're doing a turnaround. Everybody knows that their paychecks are going to bounce if they don't get it done. Or they might not have already. They might have already gone without paychecks, and and so you know it means a lot to them and their family to get the th wheels back on the ground and get the business. So you've got their full support. They want it to happen, and so uh, managing a turnaround, we at least have the whole team on the same page. Uh, managing growth, we sometimes don't have the whole team on the same page. In this case, uh, it's not disastrous. Bud's doing a good job. Uh, the company's making money. His bank is just worried that they keep loaning them more and more money. But when you look at the financial statements, they are on the next page. Page three and page four gives us one of the financial statements. On three, the other of the financial statements on four, and we are not looking at the statement of cash flow yet because we don't understand it yet. Remember, we're still learning uh, uh, how to deal with the cash flow statement. We're looking at the balance sheet and we are looking at the income state. Now let's walk through the balance sheet for a second. We've got the, how much money is 24? There's a, there, the first line on the balance sheet says cash, 24. What is that? If you look one line above that where it says Vegas supply balance sheets December 31, 2020, 2021, and 2022, then below that it says in parentheses 000, apostrophe S. That means you add a 000 to every number on the rest of the page. So that's 24,000 in cash. A lot of the public companies we're looking at, that number will be millions. And so, you know, we'll, we'll be looking at a billion dollar company, if you're looking at Walmart, right? And so, so. But, the, but it'll also have a number like 24. You just need to know is that 24 billion, 24 million, 24,000, or 24 bucks? You know, and so you're going to look at the, the, at the and the, that code is always going to be on a financial statement. In this case, it's thousands. So everything on there is thousands. And you see the most current year to the farthest right column. So we see a trend there. And we see a percentage number. What is that percentage number a percent of? Total business between the year and the next year, right? No, it's not. That would be the number, the percentage of the worth of the business? No. Look down the column, and at some point we get to 100%, where it says total assets. So that is a percentage of your total assets that is, in this case, cash. So 3% of our total assets in 2020 were in cash. 2021, 2.2% of our total assets were in cash. 2022, 1.1% of our total assets were in cash. So while the number, 24, 27, 21, doesn't tell us a lot reading left to right, it does tell us that we had more cash in previous years. But when we look at the percent number, we had three times as much cash three years ago, percent-wise. This dude's in trouble. He may be in trouble. He's got 60% of inventory. Okay, you know about inventory, don't you? Yeah. In lean, inventory is the devil. 
right? Uh, there's a case where inventory is of value. That is when your bank requires you maintain a certain level of inventory. And why the bank do, does that is because they're not on your team. <laughs> they're, they're on the team of, if you guys mess up one thing, we've got to take what we can get and try to sell it at auction. So the more inventory you have, the more money we can get out of your company if you go broke. So it's not necessarily the bank's interest for you to have high inventory or not. Uh, it, I mean, it is in the bank's interest. It's not in your interest to have a lot of money. You're right, the guy's in some trouble. And but that's an early diagnosis right now. We've got to look at a lot more things because he's not in trouble across the board. There's some things he's doing okay. Uh, but I want us to decipher the paper first before, as, we, as we look through it. So the top half of the balance sheet are his assets. That has to balance with the bottom half of the balance sheet, which are the uh, liabilities plus equity. And I can see I misspelled liability on the bottom line. Sorry about that. Um, and we see the bottom half of the page uh, in the gray. We see percentage numbers once again, but those add up to the uh, total percentage of liabilities and equity. His equity has gone down percentage-wise from 36% equity into the business to 29 and now to 22% equity of the business. Again, concluding that the guy's got some issues. All right, so he's not broke yet. His bank hasn't locked the doors. He's operating and he believes he's operating at a profit because look at the next sheet page. We see the, on the next day, this is the P&L, the profit and loss statement. His sales over this same three-year period has gone from 2.2 million to 3.2 million to 4.5 million. The guy's company is growing, uh, almost double, right? Mm -hmm. It's growing quite a bit. But so are his costs of goods sold. The percentage number in the gray is also reflective. In this case, uh, we get the 100% the is uh, somewhere down uh, the, the page to the bottom, it's the whole page, the whole column is 100% column of, of the, the top line. So everything is a percentage of the top line. You see that? The 100% is the total sales, the, the very top line. So cost of goods sold went from 75% to 78% and is that 76%? And 76%. So his cost of goods sold gone up a little bit. But that's eating at a margin. But the bottom line, uh, the profit, he's making profit. He's paying taxes less, but he's paying ta uh, taxes. His net profit was $46,000, $61,000, $76,000. That's something to make mom feel good. The profit's going up. So why is the bank... Nervous. We don't really know yet. Andrew's got some clues. The rest of you probably looked at some clues. We've seen, for example, uh, bad debt has gone from $2,000 to $9,000 to $22,000. That's way in the wrong direction. There are other things that we could just, you know, kind of graze on this financial statement and draw some conclusions. But those are opinions. And, and I don't want to give Bud Ryan an opinion. He's hired a consultant. He does want your opinion, but you better back that up with something. Back it up. You can't just guess who's going to win the Super Bowl at this point. We need some facts and some data. And, and if we had concrete facts and data, you can make a bunch of money next two weeks, right? Uh, but we don't have that much data uh, for, for the Super Bowl. But, but we have some data here that we can look at for Bud that can give him concrete information. And that's what I want us to stake our reputation on career-wise. We want to look at the concrete data. So I'm going to show you how we are going to go about that. But for a second, we are going to change to the other handout. This is what Bud Ryan's bank is looking at. They are looking at RMA data. Here, pass this up to Mindy. I'm going to the rest. Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's too much information. <laughs> I thought you were coming for a handout. Um, uh, no, no issues there. Uh, the She'll this all the money she can get. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> so this one is the one I stapled them together. But remember, I said that in the in the T 
textbook, the printed copy of this, they are opposing or facing pages. So page one on this handout is opened across from page two. And so I unstapled mine and put them that way. So this is the way the banker will be looking at them, page one on the left, page two on the right. And then the same with page three and page four. They'll be spread that way. And you will see uh, on this, this is Bud's business category. His makes number is... 423310. That's it. Thank you, guys. Uh, and that's comparing Bud's business to other businesses throughout the United States that are like him. Uh, and for uh, this sheet is one or two years dated earlier than Bud's financials are right now uh, because that's what I had and I didn't want to pay $160 to get the 2022 version. Uh, so the numbers might shift a little bit naturally, but we have a whole industry. We're comparing it against the whole industry. So the, the comparison line on the, uh, the first page, current data sorted by assets, and the right-hand side of the page is current data sorted by sales. So let's tar start at the page that says current data sorted by sales. What is Bud Ryan's sales right now? We, that's coming from the income statement. Current from the income statement is, is sales of 4.5 million, right? So 4.5 million. So if we take this chart, and we look at data sorted by sales. You see there's a column that runs three to five million. Three to five million dollars. So you can circle that column if you'd like. Because that's the column we're gonna be looking at. So like on mine, I circled it like that. Okay, so the column with three to five million dollars. Those are companies like his. The bank has looked at 26 of those businesses that are categorized the same as his. They may be in other geographical areas, but that is the size business. Now, if we want to double check on the left-hand page, it's current data sorted by assets. And his assets are taken from the balance sheet, where his total assets are uh, 1.9 million in total assets, 1.9 million. So there's a two to 10 million column. I'd say 1.9 is close enough to that. I would use that comparative. Would they do that in real life? Would probably, they round up like that? Probably, yeah, they probably would. Um, if I saw that they were doing that, uh, you will see there's not enormous difference between the second column and the third column on that one uh, as we as we go through the ratios and we spread this data and look at it we won't see but you're welcome to do that and if that was my company I would look at it both ways and I'd use the more favorable one and I'd go to my <laughs> bank and say got to use this one because we're not looking that bad we don't suck that bad so and, and that's fair that's a negotiation with you and whoever's uh, and, and they'll love the fact that you're driving your business They'll love the fact that you're looking at what other people are doing and how they're performing, and you're comparing your company to that. Now, if you look down, what we see on that, uh, the, the, the number of statements, I told you we've had 26 statements. The, the columns, the two widest columns on both those pages say exactly the same thing top to bottom. So, so uh, uh, just for reference, whichever one you're comparing to, I'm going to use the sales data, um, uh, I think. Uh, 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 we'll, we'll decide by, by Thursday which one we're going to crunch the most. Uh, but for right now, uh, what you see is all the line items with some potentially different accounting terms. You see the assets drop down to cash and cash uh, equivalents. Then you go trade receivables. Um, uh, they, but, uh, Bud's financial statement calls it accounts receivables. That's the same term. And so this, this is showing you uh, trade receivables. Uh, the, the companies that we're comparing to have about 33% of their top line 
in trade receivables, but has 31%. That's not much different. Uh, that's better, not worse, than his companies like him, an argument that he'll make for in favor. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through in time, and we're going to identify from these sheets, we're going to call this RMA data, we're going to call that the target. That is what the average company is doing that's like it. And the bank is going to be looking at this as the target. That's what they expect Bud to be doing, or better. They don't punish him if he's better, but they will punish him if he's worse. And if he's trending worse, they really want to put the brakes on, right? And so do I. I mean, from that perspective, we don't want to see him lose his business. So to start those computations, we're going to go back to our worksheet, and we are going to look at a ratio uh, analysis worksheet. Now, we are not looking at anything off of these four sheets on this page five. We're looking only at his balance sheet and income statement on page five. Now, what you can see is that uh, the current ratio, uh, right now, we look at his balance sheet for the current assets. What number does that look like to you guys? His current assets? 1.9 total current assets divided by his current liabilities 1504 1504 yes so, so you can write on this line the current asset number over the current liability number. And if you did that, you would have put together his current ratio. Put it into your calculator on your phone, and that will give you a number. That number it will give you should be 1.18. I'd like somebody to confirm that, but 1.18, we have put 1.77 divided by 1504. Is that correct? And that's for 2022. That's for 2022. I've already done the numbers for 2020 and 2021. Uh, his current ratio was 1.4. It went to 1.28. It is now 1.18. Okay, now we go, for the target, we go back to the next code numbers, and we see that the next code gives you a target of 1.87. See if you can find that. You see in the middle of the page where it says ratios? Mm -hmm. And where it says current, that's his current ratio that we're looking for. The current ratio is two different numbers depending on whether we're looking at sorted by assets or sorted by sales. If, if we look at the sorted by assets, that's what I guess I was looking at. Sorted by assets column. 1.4. Uh, his current ratio is is so let's look at what's there. Um, so, so you're on the first page, sorted by assets. We selected two to ten million. We rounded up, and we see the column for uh, the current ratio. Now, on the current ratio line, there are three numbers: one point four, one point two, one point four, one point nine, and three point two. Backwards order. What those three numbers mean of the financial statements that they analyzed. The average is 1.9, the middle number. The top quartile is 3.2. The bottom quartile is 1.4. So if a, a company, so 70, the top quartile would be 75%, above 75%, uh, and the bottom quartile is the quarter, the bottom, the, the worst companies, right? So the best numbers are 3.2, the worst numbers are uh, 1.4, we are going to use the average 1.9. Your bank will never argue with you beating the average. So 1.9 is the target. So later, what we will see is that his current ratio, which means assets to liabilities, 
is we're going to say is that too high or too low? Right now we're not going to say, but later we're going to say is that too high or too low? And then we're going to say what does that mean? But for right now we're just getting numbers, okay? So in, you can do as much of this as you want between now and Thursday, two days from now. But Thursday we will go through this in class and we will continue with filling out page five, page six, and page seven. That's all. Uh, and those are sets of ratios. Those are 14 financial ratios that give us an idea of the company's health. Yes, sir. Is it, and we're only looking at that third column over the two to ten, right? Looking at the two, let's let's use assets. Let's let's use this column that uh, that, that's the, on page one of this handout. Page one. We're going to use that column. About uh, by sales at the moment. Now at the moment we'll do it by assets, not by sales. Oh, this only if you all have the same number. Jeff. And you can do it. You can do it either way, uh, or you can do it both ways if you'd like. But for right now, for a class, we're going to go through the class as a class with that uh, that, that column. And so you can you can fill out um, just like that. All of the answers to that, uh, the numbers to do the math, are either on the financial statements that you have stapled here, or they're on the target sheet that's here. All of the numbers you need to do this. And so uh, the 14 ratios, we haven't talked about them at all. But we will. <laughs> what those ratios are and what they mean and what the trends mean and what business advice we can give Bud after we've looked at this. Because I want to know what is the true data, analyze the true data, and what Bud wants to know is what's the impact of that data and how do I drive differently. And, and this is cool, by the way. Uh, you get to the point where if you have access to your own financials, you'll start doing this to your own financial statements. And, and you'll start driving to that. And you'll feel better about your company, and you'll feel more in control than well, you've ever felt worse. Before. Well, you might feel worse at first. But then when you find out you, you're pulling yourself out of the ditch, it's going to feel good. There's nothing like uh, uh, being able to correct a slide and come out of the slide. So uh, we can't do that if we didn't know we were sliding. You know? So we're done. Uh, a couple minutes early. Uh, that's not a hard assignment. Some of you are intrigued already to look at those numbers. Go for it. Uh, and, and then you can help me make sure everybody's got the right answer on Thursday as we go through that one ratio at a time and talk about what those ratios mean and how to, uh, what it means if we're on target or below target or above target. Thanks. See you then. Thank you. I have a quick question. Sure. Uh, where do we get the 1.15?